maybe a cup of coffee would have been okay to wake us up. Uh, okay, so today we are going to be looking at uh, information systems in a different context. But one thing we would do always would be to go back and build on the concepts we have looked at earlier. Today's main focus would be on strategy. That would be the main focus, information systems and strategy. But before we do that, we would go back a little bit again to look at information systems, organizations in perspective. I say this because if you look at last, if you look at the first lecture, which was an introduction to management information systems, then the second lecture, we were looking at business processes and how we can perceive a group of business processes as an organization. Uh, so you would see that both two concepts are here. The only new concept here is the concept of strategy. So to do that, our focus would be to try and see how, how <clears throat> organizations relying heavily on information systems, how they can use the information systems to do better than others, other organizations. In other words, how can organizations rely on information systems to achieve a competitive advantage over, over others? Basically, that's what the lecture would be about. So to do that, we'll go a little bit back to look at some features of organizations that you as managers need to know in order to either acquire, build, or implement information, information systems. The features are necessary because every organization would have some unique features. Unique features in terms of the in terms of organizational culture, in terms of organizational politics, in terms of the organizational structure. So the information systems we implement would depend on some of these things. So we'll look at some features. Now the concepts we are going to be looking at in 3.1 will largely be management concepts. Then we'll look at the impact of information systems on organizations. Here, our focus would be on two things. Last week, we were very emphatic about something. We said that if we are introducing information systems into an organization, the, the impact can be transformational. You remember, it means the impact can be either we are changing a completely new business model, the way we used to operate, we are overhauling everything, or we just want to streamline some processes. This is where we look at transformational changes and incremental changes. Uh -huh. So here, we are going to build on that understanding. But our focus here will not be on incremental or just transformation. I want to look at it using another perspective. And under 3.2, our focus would be to look at the impact of information systems in terms of economy, economic impacts. We'll also try to look at some behavioral impacts of information systems on organizations. Then, uh, I started off by saying that the new concept we're introducing today is a uh, strategy. So we would want to look at some, some factors, which if an organization wants to do better than its competitor, relying on information systems, the organization must take these factors very, very seriously. So we we'll draw on uh, Michael Porter, who is a marketing guru and a researcher, who we'll draw on uh, Michael Porter's concepts to be able to explain how an organization can achieve or attain a competitive advantage over another organization. Okay. So you get the, the passwords for everybody. So when we look at that, the competitive forces model, that would just be the, the first part. The second part would be for us to look at the value chain model. And with the value chain model, we are going to be building on our understanding of what a business process is, and we looked at it last week. Series or number of activities would, would uh, follow to accomplish what a task. When we are, when we get to the value chain, we will discuss a number of activities in the organizational context and how information systems can be used uh, to enhance or improve it. So, for instance, uh, if we look at warehouse planning system or material planning systems, we last week we were looking at if you want to automate a warehousing process, you can have a system that will, you can build a system or acquire a system that will, that will institute a minimum order level of stock, a reorder level of stock, 
a maximum order level of stock. So that anytime your stock level reaches a particular threshold, then your suppliers will be what automatically informed. We will also look at synergies, and synergies basically we will be interested in the concept of uh, one plus one is equal to three. Uh -huh. And our understanding of synergies largely will draw us to understand what we mean by uh, what we mean by the value the value web. So we'll explain this. So every organization, the, the, the bottom line is that every organization will have a series of activities it must follow to accomplish organizational objectives or specific tasks. So if organization A is doing A, B, C, accomplish a task, and organization B is doing X, Y, Z. Now, if they want to work together, it will mean that the value chain or the processes or activities of organization A is going to be combined in some way at some advanced level with organization B, which has X, Y, Z. In that case, we will not only be looking at one series of activities for a value chain. We will be looking at what? A major of what? Value chains, which we will refer to as the value web. Then we we'll also look at some maybe critical things. Even if we don't want to work with, work with each other, organizations don't want to uh, work with each other. There are some core strengths they have, which they can leverage on to do better than other organizations. Then we we'll also look at network economics. What do we mean by network economics in terms of information systems? So uh, let me give you an example. We'll come to that, but let me give an example. Anybody here with iPhone 14? I keep referring to iPhone 14. Maybe it's, it's I don't know why it's always on my mind. Yeah. Anybody here with iPhone 14? 13. Samsung 13 is there. Now I, we all know the value of searching a mobile phone. Yeah. Hmm? Somebody will also say, will always say, as I say, it's a lot of land. We are holding your pocket. <laughs> We all know the value of that. So assuming you have the latest iPhone, which cannot make calls, what to be the value of the phone? It's just valueless. So the value of the phone is actually in the fact that it is able to let you connect with. So that is the concept we refer to as network economy. A lot of the things we deal with in the information age are reliant on the concept of network economy. It's because you, you are able to use it to relate with others or connect with others. That is what makes it uh, valuable. Just look at what we are going through today, these things. If we connect it, we cannot project. So the effect, the value of this just reduces to almost near to nothing. Okay. Uh, answer this call. Outside. Okay, then the last part. What are the challenges posed by strategic information systems? And how should they be how should they be addressed? So fairly an interesting and straightforward topic. So the reason why I want us to also look at the term paper today is because the concepts we have discussed in the last two lectures and the concept we are discussing today, all of those are are, are needed for you to be able to do to do this particular assignment. Now, the university's grading system, which uh, Prof. Aruna showed on the day of the orientation, 40% continuous assessment, and then 60%. Uh, uh, so it means you just need 60%, 20% uh, in the exam to be able to get a B. So ordinarily, if we give, it's coming, okay. Ordinarily, if we give assignments, very detailed and, uh, and time consuming assignments, it means you should be able to get, and you do it well, you should be able to get between 30 and, and 40. If you get your 30 and 40 in the exam, you just battle for maybe 29, 30, 31. You are, you, you are true. You are true. But unfortunately, there are always people who would not take it serious. And then they will be struggling to get uh, uh, the, the 60. No, no, the 60. The, I don't think at this level you should be interested in getting all the 60 in the exam. I mean, no. <laughs> I wouldn't be so much interested in that. OK. So uh, maybe midway during the lecture, if I see that I have to pause and look at this, we will do that. But my intention is that at the end of the lecture, we will look at this, and then we will decide on some things. So I want to find out what is an organization. 
We said we are going to look at features of an organization. We can look at organizations from different contexts or perspectives. What is an organization? The class is supposed to be very interactive. What is an organization? You can't use my accounting uh, to test example. An organization means to organize. You can't say that. Yes. OK, a group of people pursuing a common goal. Any other? The sense of organization activities. OK. Yeah, so he's relying on the concept of what? Business processes, which we looked at in the, in the last lecture. So this, I will run over this quite quickly. We can have a technical definition of what an organization is by looking at it as a formal social structure that produces resources from the environment to produce outputs. If you look at this definition, what, what comes to mind? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's quite advanced. I wasn't looking at it from that angle. Yeah, but you are right. Any other? Remember that the technical definition is saying that it is a formal structure that processes resources. The key word for me there is the resources are from an environment. And then that formal structure will use it to do what? To produce what? Outputs. So what term in this course will you relate this to? System. Excellent. It means we are looking at, in this technical definition, we are perceiving an organization as some sort of what? A system, something. But the law people will tell you, maybe Mr. Frank, I will tell, will tell you that when we are talking about an organization, we are interested in what? A legal entity. Uh -huh. From where we sit, we are interested in, in this. We are looking at an organization as what? A, a system. The behavioral definition also sees an organization as a collection of rights, which is similar to what the gentleman referred to. The collection of rights, privileges, obligations, and responsibilities that are delicately balanced over a period of time through conflict and conflict resolution. The sociologist will tell you that will define an organization from this particular perspective. So we can look at organization based on the technical definition. We can say that an organization looks like this takes resources from the environment, then through some processes, changes it to output back into the environment. And remember, we, we, the first day of the lectures, one of the features of a system or characteristics of a system we mentioned was the fact that a system will always have an input processing output. But we also said that a system would always have what we refer to as a feedback loop. You remember? Yes, so if the outputs are not up to standard, there should be some corrective mechanism to change the next line of what? Inputs. But if everything is up to scratch, up to standard, then the feedback would be some kind of a reinforcement mechanism to ensure that the organization will continue to perform the way it was performing. Okay. Now, when we say that an organization is some kind of a system taking uh, resources from the environment and producing outputs and sending it to an environment. There are a lot of things that would characterize the organization. Some of those things are structure. And when we talk about structure, we mean that the organiza an organization can be a one-man organization, two or four. Yeah, partnership, corporate entities. The hierarchy. If it is a one-man entity, the hierarchy if it's a two, if it's a partnership, if it's a corporate entity, the hierarchy would be different. So is so would be the division of labor. And when we are talking about the division of labor, we are just interested in how different tasks are shared to uh, divisional units. Then the rules and procedures, which are critical parts of an equation system, would also differ in terms of the nature of what the organization. The business processes will also differ. The culture would also differ. The culture in educational institutions. Are different from the culture in what in in banks so we are saying that all of this would characterize an organization processes rights and obligations so you see that depending on the way we define the organization the character the characteristics will be different so if you look at here we are looking at the behavioral definition 
We are looking at processes, rights, and obligation, privileges, values, norms, and the people who are there. But you will see that here, whilst the people are not included, culture will cover would, or take care, take care of that. So the features and organizations. So I mentioned that the structure is very important. For instance, if it's a one-man organization or just two or three people, there's what we call red, red tape, the, the chain of uh, command or communication. It will be shorter and a bit more straightforward. For instance, and, it, and a bit more straightforward than if it is a corporate entity. If it is a military organization, the chain of command will be different than if it is an educational institution. So the issues of accountability and authority would, 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 would differ depending on what the structure or hierarchy in the organization. All organizations subscribe to the principle of what? Efficiency. We all want to do well so that the organization's output will be better all the time. Also, all organizations are characterized by routines and business process. All these are management concepts. So let me leave it and we move on. We are saying just in the last slide that organizations are characterized by routines and business process, which we have looked at in the past, last week. So I'm not going to explain what business processes are. Okay. Now there's a two-way relationship between an organization and information technology. Two-way relationship between an organization and information technology. And to be able to explain that, I want us to look at this diagram carefully. Understanding what an organization is, we're done with that. We have also looked at what an information technology is. Do you remember information technology in lecture one, we indicated that it is a subset of the information one system, because here the people are not, are not part. But we're saying that if an organization is going to adopt an information, so this way means the organization is going to maybe adopt or implement an information technology. It means that the organization does what? Influences the information technology. But this way means what? The information technology is influencing organization. And these are the middlemen, the factors that mediate the relationship between organizations and what? Information technology. So I want us to discuss one particular concept. Now, is it possible that, let's look at information, assuming this is even, let's, let's look at it from a broader context, then we narrow it down to the organizational context. Is it possible that information technology can shape a society? How? Is it possible? So there are two questions we need to discuss. Is it possible that information technology can shape a society or an organization? Is it possible that an organization can shape an information technology? So let's discuss practically. The first one, how would information technology shape an organization? The second one is how organizations will shape information technology. An example, practical example. Yes. <laughs> Okay, the, the, from the, okay, so technology, if I get, if I got you right, technology is brought from outside into the organization. So let me ask you, if you bring the technology into the organization and it doesn't fit our business process, assuming the technology, assuming the technology is not malleable, you can easily just change it, customize it. What happens? He's, he has mentioned one key. It is what? Useless. Did, did you hear what he said? If, so it means that if we're introducing technology into an organization, then it means that certain things are very, very important. And the organizational environment. What kind of organization are we bringing the technology into? Will it fix? The culture, the people don't like technology and you are bringing technology, what will they do? They will sabotage it. Are you getting it? That's one. Apart from not liking, the people are largely illiterate folk. So when we are saying organization, we don't necessarily mean that everybody is educated. It could be, the group could be an illiterate folk. If you bring in technology, which demands a high level of uh, literacy, it means that technology will not fix. It won't work. 
the structure. It is, it is easier if it's just one man business, you are adopting technology. Even if it's training, complementary actually, the investment will just be on you. If it is just three people in the organization, cost of investment to train the people will be lower. If it's like UDS, over a thousand people, you can imagine. The nature of the business process. So the, the, the example you, you, you give, you are bringing in the technology. You didn't consider the business process. And you brought it and now you realize that mm, it won't fit. This technology doesn't do what we are doing. But you have already paid and taken your 10%. This happens a lot at the national level. Look at the, uh, the addressing system. Yesterday, I was just teasing a colleague. I went to him and in front of his gate, Corner Creek Street. And I was like, hey, Master, you are on Corner Creek Street. Education reach from here. Yeah. So it won't fit. Politics. Meanwhile, the people already have their names, and now you have brought it. So the technology, nobody will even go online and be looking for Corner Creek Street. So the technology is off. It won't fit. Politics. When we say politics, we are not only referring to national politics, organizational politics. Management decisions. Those guys at the top. Remember, those guys at the top, what kind of system do they use? Decision support systems, yeah. And then executive, yes. Yes, so uh, just a minute, I have to, have to take this off. Okay. So, what was I even saying? <laughs> yes. The mediators. The mediators. Management, where we're at management decision. Yes. Yes. So, the core concept here in terms of information technology being introduced into an organization. Then the second one, the second perspective would be organizations influencing the information technology. Can someone give an example of the second, the second one? Okay. Yes. Okay. So because of that, they don't have mobile app. They they don't use some they don't use some of the mobile app. They don't use VSS. Okay. So they go by only the text message. So okay. So they withdraw in just text message. Okay. Money, just text message. Okay. So it is rather the people in the organization or those assets themselves who are determining what type of technology. Technolo exactly. That's what I'm driving at. So the people in the organization can determine, or the nature of the processes, the culture can determine the type of technology that should be brought in. So you can look out in the market. There are two main ways you can acquire technology. Either you develop it in-house or, or you outsource it. Someone will develop or it's already developed and you acquire. So if you realize that you can't even get what is out there to fit exactly what you want to do. So you may have to develop it in-house. Those, before it's developed, you may have to talk to your, the people who are working on the ground to understand, yes. Yes, the organization influencing technology. Okay. 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 Yes, all the society influencing that technology. I'm, good, I'm happy you are using WhatsApp. That's a very good example. In fact, there are a lot of features in WhatsApp today that are largely influenced by the users. 
the usage. When WhatsApp first came, uh, uh, depending on where you, you, you sit, it wasn't largely targeted for business purposes, true or false. But in the, in the developing country context, we appropriated that technology for what? For business. Then later on, WhatsApp business came up. Instead of just sharing your status and updating your friends and family about what is going on in your life, people were updating product details. Now, WhatsApp has developed in a way that it takes care of what? The business aspects of what? Social media. Lecture one, we looked at the concept of what? Social business. So a technology which wasn't designed for business has now become a social business technology because of what? The social shaping of the technology. So this is a theory in information systems. Social shaping, the individual, the organization, or the society can shape the nature of technology that comes into that, that organization. Then the other one is technology determinism. That one, you have your processes. The technology is out there. Either you use it or you use it. Because if you don't use it, you have no alternative. So you adopt it. You will have to try and suit the demands of what? The technology. Any specific example of such a technology? The technology is there. So you pick and change your process to suit it. You don't change the technology. The, the, the delivery platforms. Delivery platforms. Yes, the food vendors are there. Okay. And now, because of the technology, that can easily get them get them more customers or get their food delivered to their customers. Okay. They adapt the technology and now acquaint themselves with the technology so that they will be able to serve their customers. So, you are, are you saying there are two keywords here? Are you saying the adopt the technology or they adapt the, te the technology. Yeah. Do, do you realize there are two different things? Uh -huh. Are you saying they adopt or they adapt? Because if it is adapt, then we are talking about what? Shaping. So they, what do you mean there? <laughs> are you getting the difference? There's a difference in, uh, yes. The fee paying in universities. Okay, okay. Yeah, you have, yeah, you can you can change it in a way. So users have no option. So look at it this way. Your example. Look at it this way. Assuming there was a technology out there, a university management system, and UDS adopted it. Uh, there's uh, there's one popularly used by uh, uh, UG. Acquired out there, they didn't develop it. In UDS case, they developed it. So assuming UDS picked that one. I want you to look at it from organizational perspective, not from the perspective of the student or the user, the organizational perspective. So if they adopted such a technology and they realize that some of the processes in the university can't fit into this software, what will they do? In the context of technology determinism, what will they do? We don't understand the question, good. Please, if you don't understand, you tell me you don't understand. <laughs> We are saying that the technology is out there. The, the university goes to pick it. They adopt it. But they realize that some of their processes don't fit into that technology. So what can they do? <coughs> yes. They abandon it or? Or they adopt. They change some of their processes to align with the technology. In that case, the technology did what? Determine the way the organization. So that's what we refer to. So in looking at this particular concept, to, oh. yes, mobile money in the context of Okay. So mobile money payment services. Okay, that service is there. So organizations pick it, they can't do anything about it. They have to, okay, yes. Vehicle tracking systems. So uh, all your example should be in a particular context. In what context? Okay. Okay. Okay, so are you saying, 
اوكي 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 you have to get that chip okay you can't change anything about it you just have to okay yeah good example any other happen online tuition okay Mm, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Instead of you determining how. So if you are going to, which, which of this would explain or fit into this? An organization uh, developing a software in-house. Which, which one would it fit? If an organization decides that, okay, we would always, we have the capacity, we have the men, we always own the resources. Want to do so it will be easier with social shaping of technology. But if we are mostly going to bring from outside, it is more likely that it will be technology determined unless we change some of our processes. Okay. So exams will be like that. You see, so you, you just need to understand these two concepts, the factors, and you have an appropriate example in mind, and you need to explain explain that you can't. You can't forget and you don't have to chew it. Yeah, so this is what we have just explained, how the relationship is influenced by, by these factors. Okay. Any questions? Now I want us to look at this diagram too. The organization and its environment. Now this colored purple portion is this is an eye. First of all, look at it from that point of view. This is an eye, and this is a lens. And the lens is the information system. And this is the system, the, this is a firm. And this is the organization or the firm's what? External environment. We are saying that the way without this lens, which is the information system, the view of the firm in terms of this will be very, very, very narrow. The, the view of the firm. We are looking at the, when we say the firm or the organization now, from now on, we are looking at a firm organization in the information age. So an organization that is highly reliant on technology. Without an information system, the view of the firm in terms of government, its competitors, customers, financial institutions, culture, the knowledge in the organization and the technology it is going to adopt or use will be very, 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 myopic but with an information system the view of the of these factors in terms of the organization will change you agree with me how would an information system influence the view of the firm in terms of the culture out there so there's a culture in the organization's environment the firm is here the firm has an information system but the firm wants this environment, which has a peculiar culture, to adopt the information system so that the organization or the firm can serve them better. Without this, we will not be able to alter the culture in terms of either one, either this or that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the, our understanding of the mediating factors is in a way affecting how the firm would see all these factors through its what? Its information system. So the information system sort of serves as the lens through which the firm would perceive and interact in an efficient and effective way with these institutions and these factors. There are instances uh, where maybe something, a system can be introduced, but because of the, the, the culture, nobody will use it. They will just continue with it. They will feel as if nothing has even happened. Look at the Ghana Post GPS. Sorry, I have to constantly use this example. Anybody here who has ever used it to look for an address or a location? You have, are you not, be, you have been using Google Maps? Google Maps. Which one? GPS. The Ghana Post GPS. Ah. 
That board. I'll just enter it into my GPS, the Ghana Post app. Then it will give me a location. So, culture. So, uh, fine, you are using that. But I am, look, we, let's look at it from just this point of view culture. I can't read. Hmm? I can't read. Listen, I can't read. I can't do all what you are saying. But I know that if I just go to WhatsApp and they tell me that if I click on this, that's location, and I send. You have this option, and you have the Ghana Post option. As an illiterate, somebody with low literacy rate, what would you do? WhatsApp. You, <laughs> you would choose the WhatsApp. Why? The or the Good. Good. So as a firm, who wants to have wide, uh, to interact with a lot of customers, suppliers, which one would you prefer to be located? Which one would you direct your customers to? Uh, you are getting the picture now. Yes, so the culture is very, very important. Apart from that, the organizational resource, the time you might put in to educate people to use what you are, this Ghana posting, huh? it will be much more expensive than, than just telling them to use a simpler app. Now, a lot of these technologies, when they are introduced, can two things from last week, incremental transformational. Then this week will change it. But we also want to say that this, some of these technologies, when you adopt them, whatever you were doing would completely be destroyed, may be destroyed. In the example of such a technology, when that technology was introduced, the traditional way of doing things died off. Huh? Posting letters and what? So it should be in conjunction with another technology. Posting fiscal letters and an email. Yes. So it means that we are considering email as a disruptive technology. Because when this particular technology was introduced, it had a sweeping change in the way communication in terms of writing letters was done. Any other? Uh, Android technology. Yes, yes, even. The use of white cards. How, how, how was the former system like? Phew. Yeah, use an SSD and get your serials and login. Yes. Any other? Yes. There's a particular traditional example. Yes. Banking and going to the bank. So it has reduced mobile money. ATM. Now, ATM, you don't have to go in. You, you can just go in. When you go, there are uh, two outlets. You can deposit. I have serious reservations about deposit. <laughs> 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 I have been assured many and time again that it's very, I've never used it. I have, I have my reservations. Any, any other? Yes. The phone centers, telecommunication communi or communication centers. Let's not look at this from a very advanced point of view. Yellow, yellow, and taxi. Look at what, when these things came, taxi and they had some demonstration. Ah, they, they, were, they were kicking against it because they felt that the taxi industry was being destroyed. And it has, it has virtually, it has destroyed it. That is an example of what a disruptive, a disruptive technology. So when such a technology is introduced, usually they, there would be some, organizations that will bring the technology. And there will be some organizations that will have the, the resources to capitalize on the technology and make a lot of money. By the time a new disruptive technology is coming, they have made their money, they will, move, they will jump onto that technology and continuously they will be the leaders. So we'll look at some examples like that. If you look at, uh, there used to be this guy, if you are old enough, there was this guy in front of the Ghana post office typing letters. Those days. Is he still there? With a typewriter. Then came. Huh? How, is, is that guy still there? His office is there. Uh, they, they still prefer. Okay. 
Okay, but so just suppose, just suppose that technology, the typewriter, and just type in your letter on your computer. You know, when that guy makes a mistake, if you go, there's a bin, just by, there used to be a bin just by his chair. <laughs> then he'll be crumbling the papers and the, uh, the carbon paper in there, the used carbon papers. But which technology? Uh, Microsoft came with the technology. Look, you don't need to even use stencil to anything to cancel. You just press the backspace to cancel. No buying of ink. You just cancel, type again, backspace, delete, and then you can do it over and over and perfect it. When you are sure, you print. So Microsoft Word and then the typewriter. So Microsoft Office is a disruptive technology as against, yeah. Okay, tractors and fiscal farming. Okay. <laughs> okay, tractors and fiscal farming. Okay. Yes, of course. Yes. 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 There was a particular thief match, and the journalists were put in a tipper truck. Do you remember? Uh, you could have said that with a saying, your mama. <laughs> yes, but today it's just a drone. You fly a drone and then you will be able to capture wide range. Yes. <laughs> so personal computers. Look, communication centers she mentioned. You would go queue. Oh, if you were schooling somewhere, you would have to go use a telephone booth. Remember? I remember our undergraduate days, there used to be a particular booth in, in Legon. You would see the queue in the evening, long queue. People would be there after this person. You would go with your, your, your card. You insert it and wait. One funny thing used to happen those evenings. Uh, people would go there, and then there's a long queue. And if you are calling your girlfriend or whatever, the, the guys will be there, especially a lot of guys from Commonwealth. They'll be there at the back. So anytime they hear somebody say, me too. Ah. <laughs> they'll start insulting. They'll be insulting. Uh, apparently, apparently, the issue was that the person is shy. And maybe the girlfriend is saying, I love you. And he's looking at the guy <laughs> saying, me too. Yes. So, so companies like Microsoft will be referred to as first movers because they invent the, the disruptive technology. So there are a lot of first movers. But organizations that have this, the, the, the resources to be able to capitalize on that technology are called fast followers. And fast followers, this particular concept is very relevant in Tamale. Some of you who are into business would, would notice this. In Tamale, if you go into a particular area and people realize that mm, this guy, before you realize, oh, everybody is doing, yes, yes. The late uh, Garba used to say, you know, Garba Lodge was one of the first lodges around. And everybody just started something lodge, something lodge, something. Yes, we call them fast followers. Now I want to look at the impact of information systems on organizations. Still look at it from the, that diagram we presented. Technology and what? This one. This one. Organizations and information technology. So we want to look at it from several perspectives. One perspective of the impact of information systems or information technology on organizations is the economic impact. Economic impact. Please refer to last week's lecture. In introduction of information technology or system in the organization. Incremental, the processes, or transformational. We are, we are taking another perspective. We want to look at it in terms of economic impacts, and also we would look at it from another, another perspective in terms of supervision or agency. So the first one, economic impact. Now, if you want the cost of participating in a market, 
uh, in economics, you call it transaction cost. So if you want to sell something, uh, maybe traditionally you would need to be able to participate in the market. You need a market stall. You will need some registrations to be done. All this will come as a cost of taking part in that market. But with the advent of technology, there are ways you can participate in a market with minimal costs. So for instance, if I no longer need my laptop, I can list it on several platforms without a fee. Even if I'm not using any platform, I can list it on my status without a charge. And people can do what? Can buy it. I get it. So the cost of selling that product, the cost of putting that advert on maybe Jonathan or Gigi or whatever is what? Very, very low. So we call that transaction cost. So based on transaction cost theory, information technology, when adopted, will reduce the cost of participating in the market. Yes. So the first explanation of the impact of information technology or information systems in organizations, we are using the explanation, we are borrowing from economics and we are using the transaction cost theory. Are you following? Transaction cost basically is the cost of what? Participating in a market. We are saying that with technology, it is easier to participate in some markets. It is cheaper to participate in some markets. And we have given examples of that. Those of you who work in banks, another critical aspect of the impact of technology in organizations is supervision. Several branches, maybe 15 years ago, the area manager or branch manager or whatever, will be roaming around with a pickup to try and monitor what is going, maybe weekly rounds, to try and monitor what is going on in various uh, branches. Today, they may, they may be using some kind of technology to be able to do that monitoring. Any example of how several branches are monitored seamlessly now, with the use of technology? Uh, like the head office, the head of operations can sit down and determine the actual balance of a particular branch, every branch. Okay. The cash position of every branch. Okay. And if, you know, branches have limits, if they exceed or they are below, yeah. you will know. And if they exceed, they are supposed to repatriate okay. the cash to the nearest bank of Ghana cash point. Okay. So this is a, a small example of that. Okay. Any, any other? CCTV. Yes. Camera, yes, reliance on CCTV cameras to monitor. Yes, so it means cost of supervision because of technology. Cost of supervision is what? Low. Eh? Log, 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 log. Clock in, yes, yes. <laughs> clock in. Some time ago, when, when we were in WA, then they introduced, those of you who are in UDS, they introduced a, a biometric system, login, right? So you either use your fingerprint or whatever, because people would close, they would say they are going to pick their kids and then phew, they are gone. So they introduce some kind of technology there. Okay, just text my name and number. So they introduce some kind of technology. So when why and we're talking about it, and one administrator said, huh? So they are doing this internally. If they bring it to us, we'll use our template and log in and go home. <laughs> when it's time for closing, we'll come and log out. <laughs> yes. So supervision, yeah, clocking in systems, especially biometric ones, can be used to lower the cost of what supervision. So we are looking at the economic impacts. So we are saying transaction, using what transaction cost theory, lower transaction cost, cost of us. Then we are also using agency theory. And you know, agency cost or agency theory basically says that there's one person called the principal and another person is the agent. <coughs> The principal delegates some responsibilities to the agent and supervises or whatever. So if we bring in technology, the principal, it will be easier for the principal to just monitor what the, the agent is doing. And if we relate it to, to organizations with several subunits or branches, then we can say that the introduction of technology will reduce agency cost. Yes. The economic impact transaction cost theory. Then agency supervision will reduce. Now, information technology within the organization also flattens the organizational structure. Look, this is a traditional 
organizational structure needs. The traditional organizational structure has somebody at the very top. It has dried up. So this is what we looked at last week. The top strategic price. This will be the management, and this will be the tactical or the operational, the operational level. We, we need practical examples to explain this. IT flattens organization. Decision making is pushed to lower levels. So, uh, in a highly command driven organization, like in the military or security agencies, there's a structure, well defined structure. But this structure can be managed better with information technology. So, in a typical organization, if you have to communicate with this person, traditionally, it will pass through minuting upon minuting, procedure upon procedure before it gets here. But if you are relying a lot on technology, it means that if you maybe want to apply for something with technology, the easiest would be what? To just send a letter to your manager and maybe copy whoever is concerned. Are you getting it? So at that level, maybe as a security or uh, just a, a, a lower level staff, you can easily communicate with anybody at the top without going through that traditional hierarchy. And that is why we're saying that when we introduce information technology in organization, one impact could be that it will do what? It will flatten the organizational. And if, it, if, if we also rely on it, the way we make decisions will be much, much more effective. So it, a traditional hierarchical organization with many levels of management can be reduced to, can be flattened by removing some of the layers and the organization, the organizational structure can be flattened like this. It is not always that when you are introducing uh, information technology that people would welcome it. What often happens? They will resist it. Because many a time we think that the technology is coming to us, to replace us. That is why we often will resist. So as a manager yourself, what will you do so that when the technology finally comes, they would accept it. The best way to do that would be not to use technology determinism. They are just sitting there before they realize they are uploading computers and installing everything. Then they pick some few people, they, they have to send them for training and come back. We don't know what is happening. But if you start consulting and telling everybody that technology is going to be introduced, how, or how do you want the technology to address or improve the way you do things. In that case, we are looking at what? Social shaping of technology. When the technology finally comes, they will embrace it and they will use it. We all heard the foreign minister chanting on a read passport. Yes, yes. How, how did the system come? Huh. So people have found their way. Maybe they adopted something like this. They just introduced it. They got that. And a lot of uh, technologies introduced or in being implemented at the uh, national level. They use this one. We are just there. Everybody, we realize they are going to do this. Everybody should change. Nine, nine day wonder. Nine day wonder. They will get their 10%, they are gone. And then we revert back to the old ways of doing things. Another government comes, they go and bring another technology, they go another technology, and on and on and on. But if you are a manager and you know some of these basic things, at least you will be able to. So let's look at let's look at this. Some of the things that may lead to the resistance to change. <laughs> some of the things that may lead to the resistance, the nature of the technology. What kind of technology have you witnessed being introduced in an organization? But because of the nature, maybe the technology, if uh, users are going to rely on it, it will collect sensitive data. So that's the nature of the technology. It collects sensitive data. But because of that, people are not comfortable using it so that their sensitive data will be sent to somebody else. So they may not use it. There may be se several other factors. Depending on the nature of business processes, the job task, the technology is introduced. Everybody in the organization will say, mm, that's not the way we work. After this technology, it won't work because of the task. They will resist it. The organizational structure. We didn't consider. Remember when we were looking at the mediating factors, the structure was a critical part. 
to the organizational structure. Because of the way the organization operates or the structure of the organization, the CEO says he is the founder. Eh? So he's no longer in the organization, but the fact that he's the founder, there's a, there's a CEO, but he says he's the founder. Anything they are going to procure from outside, he must have a hand in it. So technology is being introduced. Everybody has been consulted because the manager is aware of social shaping of technology. So he, he wants the technology to be accepted. So everybody is consulted. Founder hears of it and says, I have my vendor already. So set everything aside, give it to him, and I'll get my 10% and go. When the technology comes, People will not accept it because, and what would have been the cause? The structure in the organization. The people themselves, individually, if they have been taken off oh, in our uh, organizations, government sector, eh, people have been getting their bribes through a particular procedure because there's no technology. And then you bring in technology, what do you think they will do? So this also ties into culture. What would they do? They will just sabotage it and tell you that they will give you evidence that the system is not working. That is why the passport system. What are they saying? That there are no booklets. But if you give a bribe of thousand, they will produce booklets. Same day and print it for you. So the people. Politics can also be embedded in this. So politics at the national level is what is actually affecting the because the Goro boys, they are not even employees. But they determine whether the technology should be. Sometimes they help the managers depend on them as well. Sometimes. The guru boys. They, they, they don't only de depend on them, they work together. Uh, it's a cabal. So they tell you it's not there, and then they refer to, but if you see so and so, it will be done. Then, yes. Unfortunately, this has creeped into our educational, our educational system. Very, very unfortunate. I always say that. When this thing permeates our health system, yes. So everybody these days, everybody's trying to train a health professional in his or her family. Yes, because the confidence is not there. Bribery. Uh, but when it comes to human life, it's, it's, it's something else. So these are some of the things that can affect. Now, with all this adoption, adapting technology we are talking about. How can organization use it? Whether it is a disruptive technology, the people are, you are using this concept to try and introduce it. How can you do it such that when the technology is being used, the organization will be more efficient, more competitive than the rival, the other organizations. So Porter says that, I, I, I like diagrams, so I'm going to rush through this. Explained it. Yes. So Michael Porter says that there are some factors that will determine whether an organization can do better than its competitor if it relies on information systems. Then it lists these factors five factors new market entrants, suppliers, customers, substitute products, and competitors. Now, remember we initially indicated that the organization works in an environment. The diagram I showed earlier, it takes resources from its environment, production, and takes something output into yes. So this, that, all the four are outside of a particular environment. Before we explain this, I want to find out you, you would have been wondering, I'm saying five factors. Four are outside the over, and one is inside. Why? Before we explain it, why? New market entrants, suppliers. We just keep the question at the back of your mind. Customers and substitute products. We are saying that if an organization is going to rely on IT to do better than its competitors, it must consider these factors, these management concepts. It must consider substitute products. What are substitute products? These are economics will tell you substitute, substitute products. Products that will 
Hmm. So let's give an example of a product and a substitute. Huh? <laughs> ah, is that a popular example in your? <laughs> okay, so Milo and Bombita. Okay, let's let's give our example in the context of uh, technology. Okay, MTN. Okay, MTN what? MTN is a company. Vodafone is a company. Uh, huh? WhatsApp and Telegram. They are substitute products. Yes. So I'm back to the MTN and Vodafone. What products are substitutes in those? Okay. MTN. Service. Okay. Uh, yeah, they are broadband service. And, okay. They are substitute products because they do the same thing. Then customers. We all know what cust who customers are. Customers are those we we sell to. Then suppliers. They are those we we buy from. And the new market entrance. To to understand the concept of new market entrance, see the organization of yourself as already operating within a particular market environment. So this is the market environment. And some outsiders want to enter that market. You have to rely on technology to deal with them. That is one way you can, so you identify this as a force. But to be able to deal with this force, you have to identify the technology you can leverage on to deal with this new market entrance. Suppliers, maybe, Traditionally, this particular supplier uses some particular technology which only your competitor has access to. So for you to be able to also connect with this supplier, you also need to up your technology, organizational technologies in such a way that when you approach the suppliers, you can also have a fair share of their products. Are you getting it? Then the customers. The customers are already being served in a way. So how can you rely on technology to serve them better than your competitors. So you call a particular customer service line, which you have called before, or you have never called before, but because you have bought a product from them, and the customer service agent answers, and say, well, hello, Mr. Dramani, how may I help you? You didn't even introduce yourself. How would you feel? Then you call another customer service line and say, huh, who is on the line? <laughs> uh -huh. So the way they treat you, customer relationship management. So you can adopt some CRM, customer relationship management software, which will have a database of all your customers' data, products they have, they have, uh, they have bought, after sales services, when their products are due to be uh, maintained, or yes, to be, are due to be maintained, many other things, so that even before they call, you call to check up, check up on them. Uh, Sumo Vision, if you buy an AC from them, maybe about a year, they will call you and tell you that. Am I speaking to Susan? So, oh, you bought an AC from us a year ago. Your AC is due for servicing. That alone. And then they will tell you that we currently service ACs for 100 Ghana cities. But if you come by 28th, I guess, we'll give you a discount of 30%. The other one, we won't even, even bother. So, you keep the AC for five years, the AC breaks down, you go there, there's a warranty, and they, sell it, they tell you that, mm, no, 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 we no longer sell this AC. So, the warranty. Not valid. They can't even remember whether they sold the product to you or not. Are you getting it? So, because of that, it is easier for you, for the customers to do what? To switch. So, in order to ensure that your customers are repeat customers, how do you rely on technology to let them come back or tell others to come and subscribe? You leverage on technology and serve the customers better. In our context, how are we leveraging on technology to serve our customers better? Online lecture. Online lecture. Recorded, Recorded lectures. What are group that share? Are you getting it? So we so we knew this market. And what did we do? We started way back, did an information session. And when we did the information session, we shared, we said, okay, give us your number. If you are interested in our programs, then we put them in the group. So some of you who are here were part. From the beginning, the information session. From the information session, we move to application session. You remember, from the application session, we move to class. Uh -huh. At the end of the month, we move somewhere else. 
because we are now narrowing down to the specificity, the specific customers, so that we'll be able to serve them better. Are, are you getting it? So sometimes it is not how big the technology is, but how you perceive the technology. How will you feel if I tell you that any of you here, if you call me, I would, I would, I would know your name. Anybody here? Are you surprised? Ain't nobody here, if you call me, your name will pop up. And, and I will mention your name. Uh -huh. Maybe I'm using true caller, but maybe I'm also just taking the task. So you see that there's technology to help me do that. If you have called me before, if you have not called me and I'm saving your number, based on your application, I just save it. Are you getting it? So that when you call me to make an inquiry about our program, I know you already. And I know that, look, this guy, I must target him because he's interested. He was part of the information session. Let's find out why is he not applying. Somebody has left our WhatsApp platform. Call the course rep and find out why did he leave. All these things, when you follow up on people, even if they don't subscribe, they will say that, oh, go there. They are very particular about A, B, C, and D. So there are already technologies out there to do this. Instead of just buying or investing so much, there are already three ways out there that you can rely on to be able to do what? Save your customers better so that they can be repeat customers. And also the substitute products. How do you rely on technology to offer products that would be seen as quality or maybe cheaper or maybe different? So look at it all. You can use technology to make sure that the product is cheaper or you can use technology to make sure that the product is of quality or use technology to ensure that the product is what? Durable. I hear when people go to China to buy things to come and sell, the Chinese will tell them, this is iPhone. This is also iPhone. <laughs> uh -huh. This one for Africa. Uh -huh. So they will look at it. Yeah. If you buy wax prints, you will see that these days, different. You wash it one, two, it's gone. Same as electronic gadgets, because substitutes are there, but relying on technology will now differentiate you. This one, the new market entrance. You are already there and somebody wants to enter. How do you leverage your technology to make sure that the guy entering, he won't find it easy? Or if you are a new market entrant, how do you enter the market rely on technology so that the one who is already there will fill your entrance? That's the, the firm. So assuming we as UDSS will be are the new, we are the new market entrance. And this is the firm, the competitor, maybe UG. I guess in it as a competitor. How do we enter the market? Introduce you introduce new models, a new, completely new business model or processes. You can rely on technology to do that. But we don't have the capacity to do that. So we rely on freeware to find out how can you do this. Uh, before last week, we have been planning on acquiring a smart board. This is just an example. You know a smart board? A smart board, if it's here with a projector, the accounting lecturer would use a technologically enhanced uh, stylus or pen, sort of, uh -huh, and write on it, use the desk and the, the ink will finish. That one, the ink will finish. It will be here. As the struggle we're having with the Zoom and the projector, it won't be there. Very expensive gadget we are planning to acquire. But last week, last week, you will have realized uh, model using uh, the tripod and the mobile phone to do exactly what the smart board does. The smart board costs close to 50,000. But the technology he deployed does the same thing at zero cost. <laughs> so when those online saw that, they said, wow, they were excited. We were also excited. How would they feel as a new market entrant? Others have been doing that, but maybe universities like Tech or maybe uh, UG, they have smart boards because they have been in the business for a very long time. We don't have a smart board, but we are able to let our students who are all over the country see exactly what is going on in the classroom with just a mobile phone and a tripod. So as a new market entrant, if we go and tell online and advertise and say that 
wherever you are, you can join our lectures. Yes, to be honest with you, people have wondered how we're going to do that. How we're going to not have centers in some places and still deliver our lectures and people apply from other places. People were wondering how we're going to do that. So when it comes to accounting, what, what happens? We'll be left out. But we have found a solution to it because we have leverage on technology as a new market entrance. So this one is CAD, the firm, because the firm has not leverage on that kind of technology. So as fast followers, that's what we have done. So we are, we are on the lookout, if there's a new technology, by the time the firm, others will come, or competitors will come and adopt what we are doing, we'll move on to another, we'll move on to another technology. Maybe a new or advanced smart board would have come and we'll go and acquire it. And they will now use our system. We will now tell students that, oh, our smart board can do ABC. Yes, cannot. Are you getting it? All this will be yet. So, so though investing in new market entrants, investing as a new market entrant, it will lead to what? Repeat customers. If we also have suppliers, we have been using the example of using a maybe the warehousing system. Anytime store goes to some level, seamless communication and then. Now, back to my question. Why is the firm and the competitor in the same over? Yes. They are in the same environment. Excellent. They are already in that same same environment. Now, based on this, based on this five forces model by Michael Porter, if we leverage on the technology, we will have to make a decision. So we are doing, offering substitute products. We have entered the market with some technology, serving our suppliers or customers better. How do we sustain that? How do we sustain that? How do we sustain that? We can sustain that by making some strategic decisions. So you see that all of this would, addressing this market forces would be investments. Based on that, whatever you are doing, the activities you are doing here, you will not make a decision. You can, your decision could be that in addressing all of this, mm, we just want to concentrate on a small market, a niche market. So in our context, we said that, look, if we are able to leverage on all this technology, there will be no, there will be no reason why we should go to Bolga and open a fiscal center or go to Y and open a fiscal center. We can just be here and save them. Are you getting it? So we are concentrating on some market niche that the others are not relying on. Some universities offer their weekends on their campus alone. Others are dotted across the country. So we can also adopt one particular strategy. Then we can also say that because our competitors are offering substitute products, when we enter the market, we can make a decision that in rely on this technology, we would offer differentiated products. Our product will be so unique in such a way that it's not a substitute. Are you getting it? So unique. So we can, we can have product initiation. Look, the, the, the simplest strategy you can adopt based on all of this is to sell it cheap. Hmm? Low cost leadership. We call it low cost leadership. You just sell it cheaper. But because of the, depending on the environment, rising costs of uh, materials and other things, low cost leadership may not be an option. Maybe product differentiation, concentrating on the market niche. So th those may be, so you, you will have to deal with the five forces. Then you make a decision. Are you following? Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. Bro came in. They adopted low cost leadership, but they didn't still, they didn't survive. What could have accounted for that? Hmm? They were offering low cost leadership, but some of the forces they would have, the forces they would have dealt with would be, they, they were offering a substitute product, but how unique was that product? Now one unique product differentiation glue was coming with was high speed 
That was the product differentiation model they had. High speed, and we're all expectant, reserve numbers, ah. connected internet, massa. You go to toilet and come back, the browser is still. <laughs> so you, you, you understand. Uh -huh. So they were coming in with uh, product differentiation. And the, the, their major focus was not on voice calls, but internet. But it didn't work. Any practical example? So low cost leadership, product differentiation, focusing on a market niche, or we strengthen our customer and supplier intimacy. Why are we always stressing on customers? Because we want to be what? Repeated. We want them to go and come back. Okay. We'll finish soon. So these are the, just the explanations of, yeah. Now, back to last week's lecture, business processes. We said firms would engage in series of activities that would add value to whatever they are doing. So a business process is a series of steps. Now, remember that with this series of steps, at each step, the product changes. So take a particular raw material, which needs to be changed into a finished product for customers. The raw material at each step would change into something. It will change because what? Value is being added to it. I get it. So until it becomes a finished product, then you give it to them. So that process is what we refer to as the value chain. The value chain. So if we take our mind back and look at the information system cycle, like uh, not, information systems life cycle, information system cycle, input processing, that's just what basic, that's what I'm referring to. We can refer to that one too as the business information value chain. Because when you pick data, through that, it will transform into information. Are you getting it? Uh -huh. So we are saying that the business value chain would be a defense series of activities that value is added to product as the raw materials moves from one stage to the other. So with a value chain, this series of steps, the activities in the value, a product value chain can be divided into two. We have the primary activities and the support activities. So for instance, in this particular class, lecturer, a lecturer will come, roll slides, talk, and then go deliver a service. The lecturer will first of all have to prepare the slides, try and assimilate a lot of things and come and make sure that whatever he's doing will make sense. What the, the lecturer is doing is what? Part of the core activities. And that is what? Primary activities. You understand? <laughs> but there is somebody in the office there. If the first lecture ends and there is no snack, or 12.30, there is no lunch, there will be a problem. There will be no concentration in the last class. That is an example of what? Support activities. So looking at this diagram, again, if we say that raw materials will move from one stage and to the end and become a finished product, how can value be added to it? Value addition for us in this course is incumbent on our reliance, our reliance on what? Information technology. Value addition for us is based on our reliance on information technology. So a raw material, when we buy raw materials and change it into finished product and sell it, it passes through a number of processes. We usually have what we call the inbound logistics. Inbound logistics, basically we are referring to the procurement people will tell you, when you buy from suppliers and the materials come in to stores, how can you improve that process? Rely on technology. You can do that by relying on or investing in an automated warehousing system automated warehousing system, a computerized warehousing system. So that when your stock level reaches pre-order level, your suppliers are alerted either by email, SMS alert or something that stock has reached pre-order level. Then you will pay because of your credit rating, they will ship things, they will start sending things. So by the time it gets to the minimum level, there's delivery. 
So it means that all the time there will be what? Raw materials in stores. The same way, when the production unit is going to requisition for material from stores to go and use, if you are not careful, they will requisition and it won't go to the production unit. Huh? Where will it go to? It will go to their houses. Yeah, they will requisition home, but they will just carry it, carry it home because your systems are not able to monitor pilferage. People would steal it. So even so, it means that automated warehousing system can be external or internal, dealing with suppliers and dealing with even the production what units. Then we have operations, and with operations, this is where the raw material now is changed to what? Uh -huh, it's changed. So you can have computer control machining systems, a computer control system that will do your designing, that will do the, the changes to the raw material, the production. When that is done, the product cannot just be shipped to suppliers. If you have, sorry, customers, assuming you, don't, you are a new entrant and you don't have existing customers, so what will you do for the product to get noticed? So marketing. So you would have sales and marketing. And we can computerize that so that we can have a website. People can go there and order. And when they order, we are able to collate the orders. We are able to process it and send the orders to their addresses seamlessly by using computerized ordering systems. Even when we have sold to them, the product can malfunction. So we should be able to keep data of our customers in such a way that when products might function or if they need after sales services, who we'll know when to provide those services to them in a seamless manner. So we can have equipment maintenance systems. And then the last one, for the product to actually get to customer, we can also have outbound. Remember we started with what? Inbound logistics. So we can have outbound logistics, automated shipment and scheduling system. If you have paid for your order and everything, you, you shouldn't call back to remind, remind us that you have paid. We should just go on and package your things and ship it to you. And what you will get will be an alert and a tracking and, and a link to be able to track, to track it. So all this would be part of the primary activities in the organization's value chain. But we will have support activities. The procurement guy sitting in the office and talking to the suppliers and writing all the memos and raising all the vouchers and they are there. Then we we'll also have those operating the computer aided systems will be there. The HR people, those who are recruiting everybody, they are not in the factory floor, but they play a critical role. So they are also there, the payroll and everything. Then also we have administration and management will also be there. So all of this would be support activities and this would be what? primary activities. So assuming this particular diagram refers to a particular industry, it means that the value chain, the industry value chain be comprised of the supply, industry suppliers, suppliers. Do you understand what it means? Suppliers, suppliers. You remember when we have a system, there's a subsystem. First lecture. So that supplier will also have, that supply, okay. Then suppliers, the firm, then the distributors, and then it will go to the it will go to the customers. So a typical organization dealing with this, maybe MTN, and there, there is maybe another organization, maybe not necessarily uh, analogous or similar. Let's look at MTN and which organization could work together. Not, not necessarily teleco, another teleco. Maybe MTN and Netco. Let's look at it that way. MTN and Netco. Okay, the metering system. Yes. I believe for us to be able to use a USD code, USSD code, we will have to come to see. Uh, uh, Netco may have to uh, have some dealing with the. the uh -huh. So, Netco will have a separate value chain, how they serve their customers. MTN will have a separate value chain, how they also serve their customers. But now, because we want them to buy meters, Netco goes to MTN and said, oh, we want them to buy me. We want them to buy power through your network. Easy, seamlessly. That customer, MTN will benefit from serving that customer. Netco will benefit from serving that customer. Are you getting it? So in this case, there will be what? An integration of value chains. 
to be able to serve that particular customer. The banks do that a lot. The banks do that a lot. Don't think that if you go to Echo Bank and use your Visa card and take money, you can run to commercial bank and take. Mm -mm. Seamless. Before you even get, I always say that the banks are never patient. You withdraw the credit, the, 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 the debits. So before you get to the other end, because they have integrated their what? Their value chains. And when we have integration of value chains, we have what we refer to as the value web. A lot of value chains. So it, it happens these days, an organization can barely work, can, can barely do it alone. So the firm's value chain is linked to value chains of suppliers, distributors, and customers. Okay, so when we say value web, we mean collection of independent firms using highly synchronized IT to coordinate value chains to produce products or service collectively. Okay, any question? So the important part in this topic, what did I say it is? Strategy, strategy. How do you address, to be able to do better, how do you address the five forces? Based on the five forces, what decision are you going to take? Relying on what? Information. All the others are peripheral issues and concepts you need to know. But the core of this topic was about that. Okay. Pick one and pass it. Yeah. One. So those online, I'm going to put the case study on the on the page. Uh, where's my phone? Let me use my phone and use. More. Oh, there should be enough. I printed 60. I'll put it on the page. The interesting thing about this class is that you don't have fast, you don't have fast questions. Somebody said, oh, that's. <laughs> yeah? yeah, there are extra ones here if you haven't gotten a copy. So, yes. Okay. Class is quiet. <laughs> so it says each student or a group of at most five. There's a typo there, a group of at most five. So you would, would decide whether to do it in groups or in the I, I would suggest you do it in groups.
please those online you can pick you can click on the link to download it so if you look at it there are some guidelines so if you follow it this should every week you just make sure you write one section by the time we are done your group you are done the important part of this assignment is to identify an organization that's the important part identify an organization so each student or a group of five are required to select an organization that has developed or implemented an information system to address a specific organizational challenge. A specific organizational challenge could be that with that group, there's power tests. In UDS, resource manipulation. So they adopt a resource management system, or they will adopt smart metering, maybe a bank tool, something you, you can you can identify one. The student's task entails producing a comprehensive written case study report between 2,500 to 3,000 words. It's not a lot. The 2,500, don't be scared, but it's not a lot. Yes, one page is about maybe 500 to 800 words. So about 10 pages maximum, which is not long. Yeah? It's, it's packed. We've not finished going through it. I saying it's packed. We've lost what you have gone through. No, 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 no. Wait, when we finish going through, you will see that it's not it's not packed. It's, too, it's not packed. Okay. This report is expected to delve into the intricacies of the system's acquisition. So remember we said the organization can decide to just buy from outside or development. or implementation, or the use within a corporate social or social context. The main objective of this term paper is to serve as a demonstrative reflection of the student's assimilation of fundamental concepts indicated throughout the course. So each case study report should have a cover page and your numbers will be there. So your case study should re revolve around an organization's pursuit to address a business challenge. Yeah, there are plenty. Any organization you pick, there's a challenge. And they are, how they are using IT to deal with that. So your report should follow this particular structure. So you, you would have an abstract, which would be a summary of all what you have done, like 150 words. So then the introduction, you, you should uh, discuss the, the, the organization you have selected, the nature of the activities, the organizational structure, yeah. And all these things. If you pick in go, some of the case studies you pick, if you go to the organization website, you will see all of this. You see that straightforward. You will see it. So the, the actual writing is, is from here, three. Well, it's from four, actually. The business problem or opportunity. It should not necessarily be a problem. What opportunity was there? How did they use technology to tap that opportunity? How do they use technology to address that problem? So you see the word limit is also indicated. So you first of all discuss the problem, and then you now discuss the technology-based solution. How, how are smart meters addressing power tests? Yes. You, when I say power, you, in Jamaican people will say you. Uh -huh. Then some of the challenges, and then you list some lessons for managers. So if you are five, identify five, identify an organization, and just share the, the, the sections. Then you meet, everybody who writes a section, you meet and just synchronize it nicely. But if you look at the last part, the important part is the lessons for managers. Write about 300, 400 ways. This segment should conclude the case study by showcasing three pivotal lessons that hold relevance for managerial practitioners within an organization. If you are a manager, what have you learned from this? These lessons should be insights gleaned from the case study, providing valuable takeaways that can guide decision-making and strategic endeavors in a similar... Oh, a lot of that is just grammar. 
easy. Yeah. Don't be scared by it. But at least all the things we are discussing, when you are writing this, you should be reflecting on, on some, some of them. It is the, the purpose of this is to ensure that you don't just think that this course, you have to learn something by heart and pass and go. You should carry something with you for the rest of your. So what are you going to submit? Submission must be in soft copy only. So we have to practice what we preach. We are doing information, so nobody should print. So you will email to me. If you are right, any day we, we decide we are going to write the MIS exam, you, your assignment should be submitted before you go and write. Yes, 30 marks. 30, those online, 30 marks. So if the group gets, if the group gets 35, uh, 25 over 30, it means everybody gets 25 over 30. But what you have to ensure is that there, are, there shouldn't be free riders. So I intentionally say soft copy because some will say, oh, me, I don't have time. When you do the printing, I'll pay. Hmm. They will email it, so you take part. <laughs> Uh -huh. So it's pretty straightforward. It is also important we do this because in the exam, there will be a compulsory case study. So maybe a similar case like an organization will be there. And then I will just say, read it and answer these questions. And that one will also carry majority of the 60 marks. So maybe usually 35 marks may go to the case study. It's easy because you have done this. When you see a case study, you should be able to. We'll discuss that later, please. Yes, that's it. Yes. Yes. Assuming you are five in a group. Yes, yes. You just pick one one person, the lead. But make sure your index numbers are on the are on it. Yes. Not more than five. Not more than five. Not more than five. Because even if it's going to be five, 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 some, maybe three people may be left, maybe, or two. They can also form a group. Yes. But no, if we decide that it's group work, it must be group work. We don't want someone to do it alone. Yes, I encourage that. Ghanaian context. Uh, Ghanaian context. Let's do it Ghanaian. Because, look, if we don't do it in the Ghanaian context, so that the, the organization is what? Verifiable. Quiet. Look, if we don't do it in the Ghanaian context, hmm, go and put this thing into AI. It will just give you a report. Pe, pe, pe. <laughs> but I want to be able to check. Is it a Ghanaian? And also locally, we will have also gone through the experience of how uh, the technology has helped or has been used to solve. Uh, yes, we are aware of the use of. Yes. Oh, uh, you can, you can, you can use DHL for instance. Don't use DHL. <laughs> we discussed DHL here. Anyway, if you think you can use it, why not? Maybe it is not only the delivery. Aspect. There may be other aspects of DHL that you may want to you may want to rely rely on, but don't be thinking about an organization with a sophisticated system. No. Ah, Tamil Metro, maybe. Yeah. Don't think of a sophisticated system, but just see how the com the concepts we are discussing would apply in in that case study. GP. Okay. Yeah. GPRTU. Uh, DVLA, there are many. There are many. All the organizations now, they, are, they have something. They have something. So you should be able to do it without. Yes. Okay. Good question. How do you constitute the groups? Should we just use a particular number and Share, or you will constitute your groups. Huh? You don't know yourselves. Uh huh. So, huh? Yeah? 
So you mean I should use the, oh, we'll just count. But some are online. So what we'll do, what we may do is that, mm, okay, okay, look, uh, familiarity, this is a networking opportunity. Yes. Okay, so how do we identify, how do we remove duplication? Good question. Writing will not be the same. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, the thing is that, as I indicated, we are still cleaning the, because some have taken offers, but maybe may not come. But in the, so in the group right now, not everybody, some are not attending fiscal lectures or online, but they are not also leaving the group. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we can just add uh, a group them. Those people, they will just keep quiet. Some people don't check their WhatsApp, they are just there. So we want, but the earlier we do this too, the better. Okay, so we can, we can do it. If some leave, fine. So should we do it randomly? Ah, so I mean, yeah. I'll just leave it with you to decide how you do it. You will decide how you do it, oh? Huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. So you will decide, decide how you do it. Otherwise, I'll be doing the assignment for you, huh? Yes, uh, this is an announcement. Mr. Dudati approached me about swapping my class with him on Saturdays. So he would, I would come in the morning. Next Saturday, I'll be here, first lecture. And then he would come in the, in the afternoon. Okay, any question? Any, any question? You can stop record. Yes. So today we are going to be looking at uh, e-business and collaboration. And before I started, I heard somebody say, talking about the class rep, talking about Zoom. What was the issue about? Okay. The okay. They, they will be able to. Now, that is just a little aspect of collaboration. Collaboration basically refers to two or more people doing what? Working together in a seamless manner. Today's topic is going to touch on aspects of collaboration. We are also going to look uh, largely on different aspects of organizational processes and how information systems or information technology can be used to improve it. Now, the crux of this uh, today's lecture is to uh, build on our understanding of what information systems are. And then we'll look at the types and how we can classify them. Basically, that's what we're going to do today. So the lecture may not travel the full course of two hours. Before we can do that, we will set some targets. We will try to understand what we mean by business processes and how they are related to information systems. So I am starting on the premise that we all now, we all know what information systems are. You remember the five components, the hardware, software, data, people. Uh -huh. So we want to find out how, what are business processes and how are they related to information system in the first part. Then we also understand how systems serve different management groups in an organization. And to do that, we'll use a basic management principle. We will look at the hierarchy in an organization. That's one aspect. We will also look at functionalities in an organization. And then we see how information systems can serve 
the different functional needs for the different hierarchical structure in the organization. Then we will also try to answer why information systems for collaboration and social business are important. Anybody here without a WhatsApp? There's nobody here without a WhatsApp. But many of us are wondering, uh, anybody here who sells stuff on uh, relying largely on WhatsApp? Is there anybody here who does? OK. Uh, what do you sell? Phones? Boxes? It's services. Uh -huh, services. And usually, maybe you would uh, 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 update your status and then go to check who has viewed the status and possibly if you can contact the person. Most often, the people who have viewed your status would get in touch with you. Our reliance on social media to do business, social business, we also we refer to that as social business and we'll look at how we can collaboratively rely on some of those. Then the last part will be the role of information systems function in a business. We can only understand or appreciate the role of the information systems function in a business if we understand the business processes. If we understand the business processes, one. If we understand the different, different business or functional areas in an organization, then we'll be able to understand the role of information systems in business. We will start off by trying to answer the first part. What are business processes? What are business processes? So typically, in an exam, if you are asked a question like this, what are business processes? I won't ask a question like that in an exam. But if you are asked a question like this, as a mature student, it is difficult. At our age, it's difficult to, to learn by roots or learn by heart. So if they ask you a question, you cannot answer it. You start by doing what? Giving an example. Yes, you start by giving an example. So if I ask a question on what business processes are, and you give me an example, you can just raise up your, your hand and say, an example of a business process is buying airtime using Momo. It's a, it's a business process, isn't it? You have explained it. If you were to uh, describe it without an example, maybe the clarity would not be that way. So I would want us to randomly give examples of business processes. Ordering a KF, ordering KFC, it's an, yeah, it's an example of a process. So in your organizations, can you give an example of a business process? Yes. Ordering Bolt, yes. Ordering Bolt, everybody knows Bolt. Yes, ordering Bolt, any other business process? Ross. Yeah, buy power through Momo. Yes, very practical. Any other? Yes. Booking flight tickets. Booking a flight ticket. Okay. So our understanding of business processes are that if you look at all the examples we have given, for you to be able to uh, complete that process, you would need to go through a number of what? Steps. So business processes are largely a number of steps. Or a process basically is what? Series of steps, activities you would conduct to be able to complete a task. Now, when we relate it to business, number of steps or process you will follow to be able to accomplish a business activity. That is what we will refer to as a business processes. Usually it will involve the flow of material, the flow of information, or the flow of knowledge. Now, if you look at this part, the first point carefully, flow of material, flow of information, flow of knowledge. What can you relate it to last week's lecture? Can you relate it to something in last week's, yes? Yeah, technical and... Uh, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's inbuilt in there. Any other, any other relationship? Yes. Processing, yes, the input output continuum. So if we are saying that business processes will involve the flow of materials, information, knowledge. Business, a business process can also uh, involve the flow of data, information, knowledge. So we are just building on what we did last time. Then business processes are logically related. They are logically related. One step leads to the other for us to be able to achieve a particular objective. Now, business processes may be Functional. Uh, when we say functional, it may relate to a particular functional area. The functional areas in an organization are production, finance, HR, 
sales, marketing, and all, all of that. So it may be tied to just one particular functional area, or it may be cross-functional. So the advertisement of uh, maybe a job vacancy, the advertisement of a job vacancy. And if maybe, let's use, our, let's use our application process, UDS application process. For you to be able to apply, there's a business process. You will first of all have to go to the bank, get a voucher, come fill, submit. Are you getting it? It affects different, different functional areas. Before your admission is issued, several functional areas are involved. If you look at the recruitment process, if you apply for a job, maybe to the accounts department, it is not necessarily that your application will go straight to the accountant or the CEO for them to look at. It will go through the HR and go through a number of processes. We are saying it, uh, a business process may be cross-functional because instead of just limiting it to one particular functional area, different, different functional areas may be what? May be, may be involved. So we can then say that the best way to explain or define what a business is or an organization is, is to see it from the perspective of different, different, different business processes. Based on that, we can confidently say that when we say a business or an organization, it can be seen as a collection of what? Different, different, different business processes. And remember that the different, different business processes may be related to specific functional areas or what? It may be cross-functional, okay? Then we also say that business processes may be assets or liabilities. Earlier this morning, we were talking about basic accounting. There are some business processes you would engage in and it will lead to the release of either financial resources or some sort of resources from the organization. The organization will lose. Others to the organization would, would gain. It is on this basis that we say that it may be assets or liabilities. When we are talking about functional areas, these are examples, manufacturing and production. And the manufacturing and production, a typical business process may be assembling a product. Sales and marketing, maybe identifying or looking for what? Customers. Finance and accounting, creating financial statements or recording in what? Journals, book of entry. Then uh, human resources, hiring employees. And hiring employees is a big task. The advertising will come under it, selection will come under it, and all, all of that. Now let's look at a typical business process. The typical business process is the order fulfillment process. If you are going to order an item, like buying, an, uh, buying airtime or buying credit uh, electricity from Netco, let's look at a typical order fulfillment process. You would see that here, one part in, will involve sale, another part will involve accounting, and another part will involve what? Manufacturing. That is, in, if we look at only one, then we say that that particular process relates to what? one specific functional area. But if we are looking at it holistically, then we say that it is what? Cross-functional. So let's look at this. If you are ordering, in terms of sales, you would have to generate the order, submit, submit your order. Then the accounts department or the finance department will check. If you are going to buy it on credit, they will check your credit limit, your credit rating. Then they will approve and generate an invoice for you. You are buying on credit. Then manufacturing, they will assemble or manufacture a product and then send it to you. So when we are buying uh, something, we are buying Momo credit or we are buying electricity credit, it cuts across several, several different functional areas. And that is just a typical example. Now, how would information technology improve the different business processes, either specific business processes or functional business processes? How would technology improve that? So let's look at a typical scenario in our individual organizations. Two main ways that information technology can improve business processes, two main ways. Maybe the way you have been doing things, you just feel that uh, the way the business landscape is evolving, you need some sort of technology to improve your processes. And to improve your processes, I mean, you are not entirely changing everything in the business. You just want to make sure that customers are now served better. Products are delivered quickly. You work efficiently. Productivity is increased. You just want to do change some few steps. It may also be that 
you have just carefully examined your business and you have realized that mm, for this business to survive, I need to change the business model. For this organization to survive, I need to change the business model. And changing the business model may mean that I, I have to bring in some kind of technology and abandon completely the old ways of what? Doing things. So we are looking at, yes. Yes. E receipts, yes. And mobile renewal. Okay. We are talking about NHIS, okay. Yes. Uh, how does that work? How, how traditional was it before technology came and, and improved it? We used to buy the receipt book from controller and accountant general, okay. Yeah, if anybody, if you are going, somebody is coming to renew. Okay, and use uh, maybe some USSD code and then you renew. So how has the process changed? Okay, no overcrowding. Okay. Okay. And then delay. Delay is also removed. Uh, yes. One other critical aspect of how information technology can improve business processes, some of the processes may be duplicated. But if you introduce technology, the redundant processes will be what? The redundant processes will be removed. This, uh, yes. Account opening process in a bank. Okay. That 42 pages, but now, using the online and the online you don't have to go through several several tabs or several pages to be able to to do that this thing e payment of oh. can you hear me okay e e payment yes uh, School fee payment. Okay, give me. Okay, okay. Yeah, so if you are using the give me platform. No need to physically interact with the supplier. You pay them through that. This example was very suitable for a particular point at the latter part of the lecture. So I'll come back to you. Your name, please. Uh -huh. Say, yeah, yeah. Yes. The school selection or placement process. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, now everything is computerized. Okay. Now, if you look at the school placement, I just want to talk on a lighter note. If you look at the, the placement process, it was supposed to remove redundant processes. And when redundant processes are, 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 are removed using technology, the use of those traditional processes for the purpose of corruption is drastically reduced. Interestingly, in developing countries, we have found a way to always go around. We have, yeah, no matter how technology will improve the business process, we would find a way to, to be able to change. So we mentioned two critical points, either completely transforming the business model or the process, or you would, you would change the processes incrementally. So increasing efficiency of existing processes by automating some of the steps and also making sure that uh, things are properly things are properly streamlined. The second point is that you would when you introduce technology, you can enable an entirely new process, and that way you can even bring in a new business model. So if you tie it to last week, what we looked at, one of the key reasons why an organization may introduce an information system 
or invest in an information system would be what? The purpose of what? Survivor. They want to survive. If you want to survive and you want to have a complete re-engineering of your business process, you may as well just adopt what? A new business model that the new technology will be able to, will be able to support. So two points, how information technology can improve business process. Incremental steps or what? Transformational. Eh? It can either be incremental or it can be what? Transformational. Okay. Okay, so of my marker, traditional organization. Huh? In management, this diagram is often used to represent a traditional hierarchical organization. So we're going to have at least three levels. We will have here operational, or usually you will say tactical, right? Thank God. Operational, then the guys at the top. The organs, the CEOs, so they are involved in what strategy, not so so strategic management or the CEOs. Then these people are these people are the managers, right? So usually we we'll say we may say this management, but these are actually the middle level uh, middle level managers. Now we have been talking about information systems. From this point, we want to see how we can classify it. The information system. We can classify information systems based on the structure in the organization. So look at this. This structure. This is the top guy, the VC. In my in my case, the VC. In your case, the, the manager, the, the CEO. Then we have middle level managers. Then we have the rank and file. Those are the very, very bottom in the organization, the operational. Let's look at what they do. This guy, he does one thing and one thing every day. The guy is here. Their tasks are routine. Routine. When they are going to work, they know exactly what they are going to do. <laughs> routine. The guys here, a bit non routine. And they are the supervisors of these people, middle level managers. They are usually supervisors. Then the guys at the top, what do they do? Some of you are here, you are there, the top. I am somewhere here, middle. And some are also here. And some are not in the diagram. <laughs> the guys here at the top here, they decide, the guys at the top here, they decide whether a branch should be closed down. Here. They decide whether a branch should be open, a, brand, a new product line should be introduced, a particular product line should be what? Discontinued. They take the decision. Without these guys, these guys have no job. In management, is that not it? Without these guys, so all the data that these guys will use for the strategic direction, vision, and achievement of the mission of the organization depends largely on the data generated by those at the bottom. In an organization, if there are data entry clicks, they'll be here. Data entry clicks, cashiers, they are also here. Operation managers, they are here in the banks. Then the manager, the top management, they are also here. Do you think that if we are introducing technology in an organization for either a transformational effect or incremental effect, the information system will serve all these needs, the needs of all these people? That same system, will, one system will serve the needs of all these people. Would somebody say yes? Yeah, I'm expecting a mixed reaction. Depending on, we'll, we'll see soon depending on the nature of what? The system. The system can serve everybody or it may not. Are you getting it? So for instance, a typical example is the UCM, the University Campus Manager. That's the same system I am using as a lecturer. It's the same system you are using to log in to see whether you have paid or not. But when you log in, what you see, when I log in, I don't see that. I see more than what you see. You can see only your staff. I see all of you. And I see more detailed staff than you see. So we are saying yes. If procurement is the standard platform, it made the procurement more transparent. Yes. With e procurement using the Ghana platform, it has made e procurement more 
more easier. Later on, we are going to, and transparent, later on, we are going to look at a system that would be used for the, 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 the addressing the needs of another, a particular group outside this. Remember that using this group, there are no outsiders. But the organization is not existing in isolation. There will be suppliers. There will be customers. So what system will address their needs? That is where the Ghana platform is talking about may come in. A supply chain management information system or a supply chain system will be able to address that. If we're also looking at customers, Netco, VRA, customers, maybe a customer relationship or a bank, a customer relationship management system. But for now, we are concentrating on just internal. Routine, a bit routine, now routine, but this not routine. This guy, when he goes to work, he doesn't know what he's going to be confronted with. But it is based on the data generated by this guy that this guy can make the strategic decisions. So we are saying that when we are classifying information system, we can classify, we can describe the types of information system based on the level the information system is going to what say. Now, this operational level, let's contrast this operational level with here. There are people here who are working in sales, marketing. There are here, people here in finance, accounting, payroll, and name, whatnot. They are all here. Same people are also here. Some of them are also here. So you see that in the last slide, when we're talking about functional areas, hmm, we're talking about finance, we're talking about accounting, sales, marketing, HR, functional areas. We can also have an information system that will not serve any particular level, but it will serve a particular function. Not level though. It doesn't matter whether you are the CEO or not. It's about what? Function. What do you do? Then the information system, you can use it for that purpose. So we are looking at two classifications here. Classification of information system based on hierarchy. And classification of information system based on what? Function. So, the, 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 the lecture is ended like that. So in an exam, we'll ask a question like, using a typical Ghanaian organization, hmm, identify or classify information systems and identify the various information system what, needs. So with this at the back of your mind, let's now see the types of information systems. There, there may also be systems that would just cut across Integrated in such a way that it doesn't really matter. All of this come bulk into one system. So traditionally, you would have uh, heard of the, the, one of the most common accounting uh, information systems, maybe Tally, Sage, or something. There are specific systems that do specific things. If it's an accounting software, it's, an, it's just an accounting software. It cannot be used to address customers' complaints or or or, or integrate with supplier systems for us to be able to uh, interact seamlessly. It does that thing only. But these days, there are systems that are so integrated in nature that all the functionalities in the business we are talking about is part of that system. So that depending on who locks in, depending on your access rights, then you'll be able to see something different, depending on where you sit in the organization or what you do. So we are looking at three things here. We are looking at systems that can be classified based on this. We are looking at systems that can be classified based on what you do. And we are looking at systems that, will bring, that can bring all of them together. So depending on what you are going to do, or depending on where you sit, when you log in, based on your access rights, you can do whatever you want to, to do. So let's look at the types based on this one. OK. So the first one, the guys at the bottom, the operator at the entrance of Malcolm, the one operating the chip is here. And the type of information system they use is a, trans a TPS, a transaction, it's called transaction processing system. So somebody can be here, but can be a manager, get me right. Somebody can be here, but can be a manager. But this particular manager's tasks are routine. Because you know those are the two. There will be somebody in charge of them. But the person doesn't fall part of. Maybe there's some supervisor here before another supervisor at this particular level. A TPS would 
typically perform and record daily routine transactions necessary to conduct business. Examples will be sales order entry. People come and you are recording. Now, uh, an aside. All along, since last week, when we are talking about information system, we are, we are particular about the type of information system. We are particular about the type because an information system can be what? Manual or what? Computerized. Should I repeat that? An information system can be manual or computerized. We said hardware, software, data, people, procedures. These are the components. We said this because our focus is on what? Computerized information system. In your office, if you don't have a computer and you have a cabinet, you have your pen, and you have your files, folders, and whatnot. That is an information system, but it's not computerized. Are, are you getting the picture? Even to the extent that some researchers are saying that Romo, Romo Mill, when I say Romo Mill, you understand. Lavacho. Uh, Romo mongering. That Romo mongering is some kind of an information system in quotes. Because I come, I give some theory, it's not true. Then somebody picks it, change it. So maybe what I what I said about maybe some people were fighting outside there, and I just then somebody asked me what's happening. I said, Oh, two people are fighting, one in red shirt, one on a motorbike. I'm just giving you the raw facts, and I pass. Then you come in and say, Oh, you process it. <laughs> I it. Then he comes, another one, person picks it. Tamale is a big rumor meal. We all know that. So, but in this course, our focus is on what? Computerized. So when we are talking about sales order entry, assuming it's a manual information system, you have your corner shop, people come, you have some small book there. When they come and buy, then you pick it. Yeah, that's, that's, this is the type of system you are maintaining there. The transaction was. Processing system. So that at the end of the day, when you go, when you go to the house to cook, later on you come and you come back to the shop and you ask your little girl or boy to go home and you pick the book. Based on the entries, you can tell because the person is using what? A TP, a TPS. And then it will allow managers to monitor the status of operations and relations with the external environment. Which managers? Which managers are they talking about here? Maybe the guys here, or even a supervisor. There, okay. Then it serves a predefined structured goal and decision. For, it's used purposely for this, predefined. That is why last week I hinted that when you go to Melcom to look for something and it's not there, you come back to ask the guy or the lady at the till. He or she may not have an idea. Then we also have another type. So we can have another type for this particular group, the middle level managers. Based on the reports from here, they are able to prepare medium, short term, medium reports for the top managers. They are able to aggregate the data that is here, they are able to aggregate it, to be able to make some short term decisions, not long term based on the data generated by. So we'll call that particular type of information system here as a management information system, MIS. So you go to an NHIS and they say MIS. I don't know if, uh -huh, the NHIS, and they'll be referring to some guy there as MIS manager. MIS manager. The guy is here, somewhere here. Because there, are, there will be these guys under him who will be collecting the data and whatnot. If, the, the head of it needs some data. They will now talk to him and he will be able to produce that report. So we have one, a TPS, a transaction processing what? System. And then we have another one, a management information system. Okay. Then we can have, just, just even here, still here, we can have what we also call, so here we have a TPS, we have MIS, we can also have a DSS, a decision support system. This guy needs to make some decisions. Maybe his bosses, even here, remember we said that here, there may be some bosses. These guys also may have some bosses and they may, they may also need to make some decisions. Relying on the medium to long-term reports here. So we can have an MIS here, we can have a DSS here. But the guy at the top who decides that mm, based on the number of queries you have received so far, you should be fired. This guy. He relies on an expert system. And this particular expert system 
also relies on all of the information data generated by all these types of systems. So here, when he comes to work, maybe he would just go log in to the system and he's confronted with what we call a dashboard. So the dashboard will tell him the branches, these are the sales for all the branches. And then he will pick up his phone. Just based on that alone, he will pick up his phone and say, ah, uh, today's Monday, I've seen your targets and yours have gone down, tell me why. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know that when the, 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 the product finished at this level and you communicated, the system maybe probably did not deliver the results for those who were supposed to supply. So he, he's not aware. Unless you now explain to him why sales slumped. If it's an improvement, it is only when he makes that call that he will be, you will be able to give him the details why sales has what has gone. So we may have an expert information system or an executive information system at the, at the top. Anybody here who relies on a dashboard at this particular level here, you need a practical example. You log in, you are not confronted with the details, but summary data of what is happening in the past week, in the past month, in a particular branch about a particular product line. Anybody here? Yes. Each and every prisoner that is brought. Okay. 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 Did you hear that? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a name to your system. Uh, uh, yes, a prisoner management system. <laughs> yes. So he's able to tell. Every day when he goes to work, he logs in, he can tell which prisoner is due for court, which prisoner is due to be released, which prisoner is due for this, due for that, how many came in, and who is due for what, either medical attention or whatever. He's able to tell. Similarly, when I log into the UCM, I can tell by program how many have applied for MBA accounting, MSc accounting. I can tell how many have paid. Are you getting it? But the, somebody uh, in the office, maybe the HODs, let me, let me just move it a little bit down. The HODs cannot tell how many people apply for MIS if you are not an HOD for MIS. But I can tell how many apply for all the programs. Because I'm, when I log in, I'm confronted with a dashboard. And with some few clicks, I can tell, given, because the dashboard will give me some summary data. Then I can now call on my heads of department or coordinators and say that, look, we need to up our game in this area or what is happening in this particular area. Similarly, when the results are uploaded, I'll be able to track how many results are uploaded, who has not uploaded, which results. Okay, any other example? Okay, I was saying, uh... So I had sales staff under me. So daily, you can check the number of uh, policies each uh, sales staff have been able to uh, register. Okay. And the amount and the type of policies. So you can have the total number of policies and they can segment it if it are. Uh, uh, life policies that are in um, uh, like death mm. or the other investment policies. Policies, okay. Then at the end of the day, you can decide to engage them from where we are falling short. short. Mm. Uh, and, and where will you place yourself here? Yeah. So that will be the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. He says you place yourself at the middle. Okay. Now, all these systems, all these systems uh, may also give us an opportunity to be able to make some decisions based on the data that is available. Typically, it would have been difficult for 
we as humans to sit down and analyze the data and come out with certain trends that the system will present to us to be able to aid our decision making. Have you heard of the term business intelligence? Business intelligence. Business intelligence. Is it is possible that with all the data you guys have used to apply for admission, based on some statistical or analytical software, I may be able to come up with some hidden trends that would not have been possible by my brain. Based on the data you have supplied, the system. So we are saying that all of this may have some sort of system there to help support our decision making. So we may have a bit of this which will have a functionality to be able to perform some business intelligence functions. Yeah. We can call it a database, not necessarily. An example is Power BI. A database typically is what? You have stored different kinds of data of different varieties and volume in it. But we're saying that to be able to make meaningful decisions or discover trends hidden in the data, you need what we call a system for business intelligence. Are, are you getting it? Okay. So it's slightly different. Okay, now let's look at, yeah, we've looked at, we'll look at these three in detail. Management information systems. Management information systems. And we said, we, are saying that the people here are those who would be using a management information system, middle level managers. So to provide reports on the firm's current performance based on data from where? Here, the TPS, okay? To provide answers to routine questions with predefined procedures for answering them. So this guy has, the guys here, the, the, the answers, sometimes you, you, you the system may even present you with commonly asked questions and their answers. Huh? Facebook does that brilliantly. Commonly asked questions. Because of the data that is available on your page or on your system, you may be able to, to do that. Okay? Then we are also saying that typically, it will have little analytical capability. Not much capability, little. Then, Let's look at this. How management information systems obtain their data from organizations? Let's look at the typical integration of a transaction processing system and a management information system when you order. So transaction processes, and we're talking about the guys at the bottom. Typically, when you are ordering, order processing, materials resource planning, if it's a production, if it's a production uh, uh, entity, it means that before any item is uh, manufactured or produced, materials will have to move from where? From, it will have to be requisitioned and it will move from stores to production. Now, these days there are intelligence systems. You just don't move things from store to the production unit. They may have an intelligence system, a material resource planning system, which will determine as and when uh, materials are needed from the stores. The production unit would seamlessly communicate with stores and stores would deliver. It may do that either internally or with external suppliers. Have you heard of the system called JIT? It's just in time, JIT, J-I-T, just in time systems. So as and when stock levels move to a particular level. So maybe you are maintaining a material resource planning system. Say that in your stores, anytime your, store, your stock capacity reaches, usually we have a maximum level, we have a minimum level, and we have in between what? A reorder level. So that when your stock levels reaches the reorder level, the system may just trigger your suppliers to send in you. So we can have an integrated system like that. Then the accounting will also have a ledger system for recording transactions. But all of this is done at, by those who are at the what? At the bottom. And the MIS guys would deal with issues that has to do with sales data, unit product or cost data. If they have to change product, product change data, and then the cost of all the materials expenses, these guys will deal with that. And they are able to generate reports based on what? The management information, information system. 
So a typical report from the management information system will look like this. A typical report may look like this. So we have a product, we have product description, sales region, actual sales plan, and actual, actual sales. Actual versus plan to see whether there are variances, uh, there are positive or negative variances. So what we are saying, what you, you will hear me give an example of system, system, system. <laughs> Your system may just be an Excel sheet. Is that possible? The kind of system you have, it may just be an Excel sheet and you can use an Excel sheet to be able to do this. Remember that we are using a continuum. We are saying that at the very extreme, you can have a manual system. Your filing cabinet, your flat file and folders and whatnot. At the ex other extreme end, you can have a highly computerized system. So in between, we can, this can, an Excel can do this and that can be your system in your organization. Because with that, you can find the hardware there because the Excel will operate using either a laptop or a desktop. The hardware is there. The software is there, Excel. You are there, the people, the procedures are there. Are you getting it? So when we are talking about MIS, we are not or IS, we are not necessarily just thinking about some very, very complex system. Okay, we also talked briefly about the decision support system, system which can also serve the middle level management, but may support some non-routine decision making. Example, what is the impact on the production schedule if December sales double? This particular system will be able to answer that. Now, before we made our admissions, we had we in the business who had our projections. If our projections are doubled, what could possibly happen? So maybe we can have some Excel sheets so that if we're expecting 50 and 100 people signed up, basically what we'll do is we'll just go and enter the 100. And the 100 will affect our cost, our expenditure, our revenue, and everything. Are you getting it? In that case, we'll be, we'll be looking at what? A decision support system. So based on those figures, we'll not be able to make certain decisions. Either we should what? Change the venue, change the supplier for the lunch, or abandon the program if we cannot handle it. Okay. Then we're also saying that a decision support system may use external information as well as a transaction processing system or a management information system. And the example someone gave about Ghana. Yeah, assuming you are dealing with suppliers who are far away, maybe South Africa, far away, but you have a material planning system which operates on a JIT basis, just in time. So as and when your stock levels go down, an alert is sent to your suppliers, and your suppliers are not within the organization. So we're saying that a decision support system may use what? External data. So you may rely on external data to be able to inform certain decisions in the organization. Another example of a decision support system may be a voyage estimating system. Uh, ships, when a ship sails off from UK or Hong Kong, we are able to tell how long it will take the ship to what? To reach Ghana. So your delivery package, when you track it online, you have shipped a, a, a car, you'll be able to tell that, oh, three weeks time, it will be here. It is based on such systems that such estimations are able to be conducted. Then the last one, the last one would be the executive support systems. The executive support systems that support senior management and addresses non-routine decisions. We say that decisions are non-routine because it requires, it requires judgment. It requires judgment. We say it requires judgment because look, but all data may point to the fact that a particular product line should be what? Discontinued based on the data that this particular product line, we continuously have made losses for three years. Based on that, you say that, okay, let's discontinue it. But as a manager, because this particular level, you make now routine decisions and it involves judgment, other external factors which are not captured by the system may influence your decision as a manager. Later on, we'll be talking about knowledge management system. Maybe previously, you have encountered a scenario in a different organization with different products. And instead of discontinuing it, you just push a little, hard, a little harder. Maybe increased advertising campaign, more, increase with, uh, uh, more engagement with suppliers, more engagement, more customer and supplier information, and maybe the product picked up. So based on that experience, you may say that, well, 
though the data says that this particular product line should be discontinued. Based on my past experience, I feel that we should give it just one more year to see. It is because of the judgment. And then this judgment may largely, be, may largely depend on what? Your experience as a manager. But the guy at the bottom, he hasn't got that luxury to do that, to use his judgment to change things. But you at the very top, using our executive support system, the data is presented, but you still feel that based on your experience, based on your knowledge, the product line should continue. The branch should not be what? It should not be closed down because you would have evaluated a lot of things. And because of your insight in the area, you may push that it, may, it, shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be discontinued. And a lot of that will also involve the use of what? External data. External data. One of the favorite areas for exams, types of information systems, and the different categories they, they serve. So we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, the use of dashboards by those people. Digital dashboard with real-time view of firms' financial performance. With the people at the top, when they log in, with few clicks, they are able to tell how much sales was made, how much profit we are making, how much losses we are making, how many items have been sold. They can easily, they can easily do that. But when we have these different types of systems, either serving different management levels or different functionalities, it comes with a lot of disadvantages, some disadvantages. So organizations are gradually, well, organizations have moved away from just stand alone or legacy systems to integrated what? Systems. Integrated systems. So we'll look at some of them. And enterprise applications are systems which are used to link the entire enterprise. So we'll not say that because we have a sales department, we'll go and buy a, a customer relationship management or a sales software, or we have an accounting department, let's buy accounting software. Then later, when we need other system for another function, we'll go and buy it. When we do that, the systems will be what? Stand alone. They will not be able to talk to each other. Let's talk about elections just a little bit. The last elections, how NDC organized or, or collated their data. Do you think their data, all their data talked to each other comprehensively? Yeah, so it was difficult for them to tell. But if we did it, if they did it in, I think I've given myself up by saying that if we. <laughs> <laughs> you understand eh? Okay. Uh -huh. So I'm saying it in quotes because I'm, I'm a Ghanaian. <laughs> So you get the picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this particular system <laughs> will span the, all the functional areas, but not limited to only one functionality. Not limited to only one functionality. And it will execute different business processes across the organization. And it will include all the levels. There's a diagram that clearly explains that. So under that, we're going to look at four applications under enterprise applications. Enterprise, what we call enterprise resource planning systems, ERP. Have you heard it before? ERP, enterprise resource planning systems. They also have supply chain management systems that will address the GANEP issue. Then we have customer relationship management systems, banks, telecos, and then we have knowledge management systems. I'm very much interested in the last one, the knowledge management systems. Let's take our minds back. Data information and what the next one is knowledge you see the continuum you have data is transformed into what information the information very if the information is very well assimilated with your experiences your insight then we have knowledge now when people are in the organization and they have been there for several years 20 years and they later retire or leave the organization what may be the impact on the organization Look at Sidun Ketia. Several years experience in political engagements. Now stepped down as secretary and wants to be what? Chairman, if he didn't get it. With all the several years knowledge he has acquired, is there a way that we can rely on technology to document this? The experiences of people, the insight of people. 
we can have knowledge management systems that can help document this in our organization. And you can do it in a very interactive way. You can create an organizational platform where people can interact freely and share their views on issues, and you save it. So that later on, when you are in that person's position, you can easily refer to the view of that person or the insight of that person, and it can guide your decision making. But many organizations don't do that. That is why sometimes, so this happens a lot in banks. Somebody will be in a particular bank and another bank will want to coach the person. Does it still happen? Yeah. They do, the banks do that a lot. And then the, the current bank will offer a higher salary. Why? Because they know that if this guy leaves, there may be some, the guy has worked there for a very long time and has gathered some experiences. He's knowledgeable in some, certain things and has got some informed insight if he leaves. They're in trouble because he's going to start working there and applying that knowledge. So basically, what they will do is they will increase your salary. Complementary assets. You remember last week, because they see that as a complementary asset to certain things in the organization. If you leave those things, there may be a slump in sales, a reduction in productivity, a reduction in what profits, financial performance. So, enterprise resource planning system. This is a typical architecture of an enterprise application. If you look at it carefully, you will see here at the bottom, these are the functional areas we were talking about earlier. You have sales and marketing, manufacturing and production, finance and accounting, and human resources. But we also said that another way you can classify the information system is what? By looking at the hierarchy, right? So you see that some people will be at the top. Look at the colors. The guys at the top are here. There are some here and there are some here. But when we are talking about an enterprise application or an ERP, it will serve all the structure this way, horizontally and what? Vertically. All the functional areas are served by this oval. And then the system will also serve all the different, uh, from top to what? Bottom, different levels in the organization. So you see that with a supply chain management system, the system will be able, it's integrated in such a way that they will be able to communicate with their suppliers and other what, business partners. Then a customer relationship management system, they'll be able to uh, uh, communicate and deal with their customers and other what, distributors. But if you look at it in between, all the different processes can be dealt with by this hierarchical structure and also the horizontal one. And that is the integrative nature of what? An enterprise resource planning system. Any example of an enterprise, a common enterprise resource plan, say Microsoft or Dynamics. Anybody who uses a system in their organization, such that there's only one software in the organization. The accountant uses it. The, the manager uses it. The branch manager uses it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. NIA. Okay. How does it work? Okay. So listen carefully. It deals with the applicants, the employees, and management. So let's place them. Employees. <laughs> the employees will fall here. Right, and management will fall here. But there are also applicants, and applicants will fall where? Either here or here. No, here, there'll be customers, not so. But there will also be suppliers, maybe those who supply the plastic cards, those who supply other materials which makes uh, the NIEs work seamless. They may also be here. So that is a typical example. What is the name? Uh, you call it EMS, okay. Any, any other? Yes. F12. Huh? Five. Falcon. Falcon. Okay, so Falcon 12. Okay. Hams, yes, yes. Anybody here who use Hams? Health. Is it health? Health administration management. Excellent. Yes. Finaco. Which organization? 
stand back. You have finished, you people have finished your, 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 your term paper. So the term paper for the 40 maths is going to center on a system in a typical organization. Yes. Yes, so if you are working in a bank, you are working in the, with the prison service, the police service, then the, the term paper would ask you to examine this system, or GES, to examine the systems that are being used. You, you start off by thinking of a problem that exists in the organization and how that system came to solve that problem. That is what your term paper would be for 30 marks. <laughs> yes, so it would, yes. No, I didn't get that. Yes. It's for, yes. Yes, this one is 10. Yes. Uh, eh? <laughs> eh? Ah, who struggled to get 16 months? Yes. Yeah, so if you get 20 from the exam and add, you are gone. And basically, the purpose of this particular course is to uh, is not to show you how to use a particular technology, mm -mm. but to open your eyes to the fact that you can use technology to increase efficiency, productivity in your organization as a manager. And I, I always tell my colleagues, if you are finding it difficult to do a particular task, Google it. The technology to help you do that will be there. But if you don't know, as a manager, you will always be asking people to come and use your laptop to do something. That's how come your, your documents will leak. Yes. People will be outside and they know exactly what you are doing. Okay, so now I want us to look at collaboration. I want us to look at collaboration. When we say collaborate, what do we mean? And I, I have been using this joke for a very long time. When SHS one from JHS, we had an accounting uh, master, we call that accounting master, not lecturer, accounting master. First day of lecture, this guy comes in front of the class and he asks us what accounting is. From JHS to accounting. <laughs> so we're just sitting looking at him in Tamasco. If you were fortunate to go to Tamasco, then you would have met him. Arab Chang Tamasco. The way you are looking at me, <laughs> you didn't get the opportunity to go. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. The only school in the north. The, uh -huh. That's why I'm saying if you were fortunate. <laughs> 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 eh? The only school. Huh? That from where? No, 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 no. So this guy comes, stands in front of him, and then you ask, what is accounting? Well, Nino's was sitting looking at him. He said, to understand accounting, you must understand first what a transaction is. <laughs> so what is a transaction? We're still looking at him, and he says, a transaction means to transact. <laughs> <laughs> and accounting means to account. <laughs> So I'm doing that same thing today. What is collaboration? So collaborate means to... Uh -huh. Collaboration basically looks at two or more people just teaming up and working together. And working together. Two or more people working together. Yeah, this one's very easy to follow up. Customer relationship and then knowledge moving now. Explain that. Ah. So before we look at collaboration, this thing is very important. Let me explain something. Looking at the diagram we presented, there were two external parties. Do you, you remember that? The customers, exactly. So within the organization, within the organization, there was something like this. So we had something like this, and then something like this, where suppliers were here, and customers, the diagram was basically drawing our attention to the fact that there are internal and external stakeholders. There are internal and external stakeholders. Now, have you heard of the term local area 
network lab and then okay wide area network okay very self-explanatory the internal stakeholders which one do you think they are going to rely on the local and the external what will they rely on so when we are talking about a network, if when we are talking about connectivity, we are basically reducing it to these two, internal and external. Now, let me ask a funny question. Where would the internet fall? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why? Okay. Why? So these guys, which one would they rely on? Customers and suppliers to be able to have an integrated system with the with those within the organization. Let me take it again. Here, with the suppliers, we are saying that we can have a material planning system, which may be in the form of a just-in-time system. So that when stock levels reach three other levels, they will be alerted and then they will supply. Customer relationship, if a customer's product has a problem, the customer can seamlessly also what, communicate. But remember that with the customer and the supplier's communication, is external to what is happening in the organization. So the system should be in such a way that it can integrate with the outside system for that communication to be what? Seamless. Are you getting it? When it is local, just within, we will have the first one. So I will look at technology. So internet network based on internet standards. And then the company website accessible only to authorized vendors or suppliers. So the first one, extra net, vendors and suppliers, supplier, vendor. So the company would have its system, but it has opened it up to these people to be able to have a little bit of access to this. So if we're looking at internet and extra net, local and wide area, again, I'm going to ask my question, where would the internet fall? Don't answer, prosper. Where would the internet fall? Remember that the first one, they're also saying that it is also based on internet standards. Where would the internet fall? Hmm? The, question, the question again. We are saying that, just look at this. Internal network, internet is an internet network based on internet standards, often a private access area in companies on a company's website. So we are saying that this is limited, just within the organization. Then this one, Accessibility is given to authorized vendors and what? Suppliers. Where would the internet fall? It will still fall under. Okay. Then both. Then what is the internet? What is the internet? So the link of network. Uh -huh. Internet works. Oh. <laughs> okay. Is it now? Let me let me ask you. Is it possible that uh, uh, my 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 question is going to give away my answer? Is it possible that without the internet, the these guys can have access? That is, is it possible? You cannot answer. It's not possible. Uh huh. So the technical guys, is it possible without the internet? Can the outsiders have access? Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. huh? NHIS without the internet, using what? On the internet. <laughs> Lies, uh huh? So I'm coming. If you don't have data, uh -huh. Uh -huh. we are going to where I. So if you don't have data, but your device still needs to connect to a particular network, despite the lack of what? Data. Are you getting it? 
So it's not using your data, but it still needs to connect to, because this one is what? International what? Network is global. This network is global. There are other terms. There are other terms. I'm going to introduce. We pause a little bit. Of. Yes. 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 Somebody. Has, somebody. Has, just a minute. Okay. He's explaining. He's explaining the. He's explaining the. Yeah. When I ask. Okay. He's spot on. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Uh -huh. The ruling on. Uh -huh. So, yes, yes. What is the ruling? Can you, with our internet, can you access? Uh -huh. That is integrated in, uh, with our system. So, without our internet, uh, our system having access to the internet, they cannot reach our system. So, thereby, if you're using SMS, the short code, you can't buy power because you don't have internet. Okay. So, it means the system still rely on internet. To pay. But not your connectivity not to the internet pay. as a customer, but their system must be connected, right? That's what you are saying. Yes. Is that okay? Later on, we'll also try to distinguish between you having uh, uh, network access and you having access to the World Wide Web later. Uh -huh. When you say, uh, well, I am connected, but Nothing is coming. And you go and check your data. Data is there one day, but still, mm -hmm. later, we'll look at that. Still based on this connectivity, these terms are important for our understanding. And we'll later on in, in subsequent lectures build on some of them, especially the aspect of electronic business. What is e-business? Yes, doing business electronically, okay. Or, or, uh, or, or in short, <laughs> or in short, Baumia. <laughs> That's why it's How different is that from e commerce? E business. He says doing business electronically. I think your definition is, is very close to my accounting lecturer's definition of things doing business electronically. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> How different is that from electronic commerce? We know what commerce is. Buy and what? Sell. But co commerce may go beyond just buying and selling. When you are pro providing customer, customers with awareness of potential products, it's also part of what? It's also part of e-commerce. Yeah, electronic system of buying and selling. So that's e-commerce, right? How different is e-business from e-commerce? Yes. You don't need to have a fiscal shop. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Okay, I partly agree. Any other? Look at this. The functional areas are the here. Sales, accounting, and whatnot, and HR. <laughs> well, we are getting there. So you have sales, you have HR, you have accounting, and whatnot. But somebody just said e-commerce is what? Providing product information, buying, selling. It may not involve other aspects of the functional areas of the organization. Which one is bigger than the other? Hmm. Which one is bigger than the other? We're saying that e-business involves all the functional areas, hiring of employees, accounting, using uh, technology, marketing, customer relationship and supply chain, and any other functional area. But e-commerce, buying, selling, providing product information. Which one is bigger than the other? Which one is a subset of the other? Oh. 
ओके सो वो कम टू द कोलैबोरेशन द इश्यू ऑफ कोलैबोरेशन वन वीक वन वीक से कोलैबोरेशन कोलैबोरेशन मींस टू कोलैबोरेट कोलैबोरेशन कैन बी शॉर्ट लिव्ड और व्हाट लॉन्ग टर्म जस्ट राइट नाउ व्हाट वी आर डूइंग इज कोलैबोरेशन we are collaborating face to face and then the use of what zoom that's why when somebody mentioned when i came in and somebody mentioned i was a bit uh, interested in it it can also be formal or informal these are things we know already growing importance of collaboration because of the changing nature of work the way we used to work has changed tremendously and so there is the need for us to rely on different kinds of technology To be able to work in a more virtual and more engaging way. Then the growth of professional work. There are some here who there are some jobs now you can apply for, and you don't need to move. You can be here and be working for a company in the U.S. Yeah, the growing nature of professional work. You can get a job here, be working every day. You deliver whatever you are supposed to deliver. and go on to do other things because productivity is not based on how long you stay in the in the office but what task you have been able to work, to to complete and many others also the changing nature of the organization several years ago about 10 years ago if you had a phd online and you bring it to a university they would they would they would say ah online online phd and we used to look down on them today look at what we are doing people are far away and they are part of this lecture nobody will question their certificates if they graduate because we have now come to realize that offering education through this means is as effective as just doing it face to face so these are some of the reasons why collaboration is important then i also talked briefly about social business the use of social networking platforms to engage employees customers and suppliers we all know sharp don't we sharp the the organization sharp sharp is a product line but there's an a corporation called sharp ah sharp sharp tv sharp tv uh -huh. that's what i mean sharp japanese right is it japanese is sharp japanese i think it's japanese sharp is a subsidiary sharp is a subsidiary of fox fox com i think that's the name some of our training years ago productivity profitability everything was slumping going down relationship with top level in top level management and middle and lower level management was autocratic top down command driven so we tell you what to do you do it without question and it affected productivity so much when they realized in 2013 they adopted a new technology to be able to collaborate and work better they adopted yama have you heard of yama yama a, a social a, a networking organizational networking platform by microsoft I think in 2013 so that employees could interact with each other easily it doesn't matter whether you are the ceo anybody is like having a whatsapp platform in your organization you can say anything but whatsapp platforms that still would not bring that command structure you know there are some whatsapp platform your boss is there you can say anything so the employees will leave that platform and go and create another one and be talking about everything that's going on in the organization because the boss is not tolerant so they created they adopted this app and created and created a culture of what tolerance working together anything at all you want to say you can say it and with that they were able to transform their fortunes around this is an example of the use of collaborative technology these days many of us engage in buying and selling e-commerce who are using any app we just use whatsapp yeah now everybody in the class if you have saved their numbers you have something to sell and you put it on your whatsapp and they view they may be interested they will get in touch with you you sell it you are conducting what we refer to as what social social business was whatsapp designed to conduct social business 
Africans. <laughs> we adapted and adopted it to, for the purpose of what? Social business. Any other app that you think is used for social business? Telegram. Facebook. Telegram. Telegram. Instagram. TikTok. Recently, TikTok. Hmm. And it's driving people crazy. Have you seen that woman? I don't know whether she's Nigerian. There's one woman who always comes on TikTok uh, saying how much money she's making. Have you seen that woman? So elderly woman who, and she'll be doing stuff and you, uh, anytime I see that, I shake my head and say, oh. Say Dallas, I think she's Nigerian. Dallas, Dallas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, business benefits of teamwork and collaboration. Oh, these are self-explanatory things we know. Investment in collaboration technology can return large rewards, especially in sales and marketing. The emphasis is on sales and marketing because here we are most interested in what? Customer relationship management. It is only here that you will have repeat customers. When we say repeat customers, people come to buy things from you and they are happy and willing to come back. When you use customer relationship uh, management systems to collaborate effectively, you will have repeat customers. It can also lead to increase in productivity. If you resolve problems, look, the problems you guys have, if we res always resolve it, first day of election, second day, somebody contacted me, I was like, and forwarded a feedback from somebody who was here. Somebody chatted you, one of you, forwarded it to me. They said, oh, that we did well first day. They hope it will continue. Hmm? So we are not we, we are putting in more effort to increase productivity and serve you better because we want you to become what repeat customers as well as ambassadors for what for our program. You know I don't lose opportunity to market. I will never do that. Then the, there's also the use of the issue of quality, faster resolution of quality issues. If we use uh, better collaborative technologies, we'll be able to do that better. Innovation, more ideas for products and services. These are the business benefits. And customer service complaints handled more rapidly. The Netco people, the VRA people do that. But that VRA line, you call it 10 times, nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody will answer. <laughs> <laughs> then financial performance. All of this is geared towards what? Increasing, re increasing revenue. Huh? Yeah, so requirements for collaboration. I want us to look at a particular diet. Requirements for collaboration. The last point in the last slide was financial what? performance. There was also the issue of what? Productivity. All of that, all of the points we looked at leads to firm performance. But how can we achieve firm performance? To be able to achieve firm performance, the way we collab, the quality of our collaboration should be what? Heightened. It should be enhanced. And we can only enhance that by looking at two main factors. So this diagram is basically saying that in order to have effective collaboration or good collaboration quality, you need uh, the capability to be able to what? Collaborate. <laughs> if you, the, what are the capabilities for you to be able to collaborate? You should have an open culture. You are in a WhatsApp platform, you are the CEO, and people are afraid to say things. Yeah, so you must have an open culture. Apart from that, a decentralized structure. The traditional, the traditional structure is this one. Somebody's at the top, somebody's at the middle, and somebody is at the bottom. So even on that platform where you want to collaborate, you still see this structure there. It means communication will still be what? From top to bottom. People will be scared to say certain, certain things. Then the breadth of collaboration. We say collaborate. You have an open culture. But when we want to collaborate, the managers will still go and be talking to each other. <laughs> so the breath is not, it's not decentralized in a way that those at the bottom will be able to open up and tell the, instead of grabbing maybe the watchman to go and sit on a table, the CEO will not do that. But sometimes these are the, those at the bottom, they have critical information, yes, about what is going on in the organization. When we have the cap capability, we need the what? The technology, the collaboration technology. These days, there are several, several, several 
collaborative technologies. We are using one currently, Zoom, email, cloud platforms, storage platforms like Google Drive, Microsoft Teams, so many collaborative technologies. <laughs> yes, so this. And as we go on, you guys did research before this class. A lot of the things we discuss here try to relate. It is, not, it is not coincidence that you do research and come and do this course, or you do research the first day. It is not coincidence. And it's not also a coincidence that research methods will be the first trimester course. Because a lot of the things you do, you will have to relate it to so that you can have a better, to a, a better insight to be able to choose a very relevant topic. This can be a topic. You want to look at how the collaborative capability and organization alongside the techno a particular kind of technology improves organizational what performance and you want to see the mediating effect of what collaboration quality so with this any organization any, any, anybody this can be adapted for any organization and then you now try to find out what can you use to measure collaboration quality so you now look at the organization. In that bank, is there an open culture? In that bank, decentralized structure, is a manager doing everything? In that organization, breath of collaboration. Then you look at the technology. What kind of technology is the organization using? Was the technology acquired outside? Was it built in-house? All of this will influence this, and then it will lead to that case. Okay. How do we build a collaborative culture? We have spoken a little bit against command and control organization. Sharp was operating a command and control organization and they ran into problems. That's why they adopted a more open culture by adopting what? Yama, yes. Collaborative business culture, senior managers rely on teams of employees. So they will engage, the team of employees can be security. The top can come and engage with them. Policies, products, design, processes, and systems rely on what? Teams. Teamwork is very, very important. Which tools can we use to collaborate? We have mentioned some of them. Email and instant messaging, text, WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Wikis. Anybody who knows what a wiki is? Anybody here? Some, some people here can build a website. They can code. But wikis give those who are ninos in web development an opportunity to be able to go to a particular website and also add something. Either a text or maybe a graphic, depending on the nature of that website. It will give you the opportunity to also add some content to it. So... Uh -huh. A typical example of a wiki is what? Wikipedia. Have you ever wondered how, how the content comes about? Who puts it there? Anybody, you can also go there and contribute to the, you can modify what is on there. So if somebody has written something about the people of Changli, that they throw stones a lot, they attack policemen and whatnot, you can go there and edit it. It will be reviewed. So as and when people find something faulty or they need to update, they go there, and update it. So the information you pick from wikis at a particular point in time may not be totally what? Accurate. That is why later on when you start your research, we will discourage you from relying on Wikipedia to write because everything there may not be what? May not be true. Then virtual worlds. Anybody here who plays games? How do we collaborate? Anybody here? Eh? Yeah, we can all adopt a virtual representation of ourselves and, and work together online. So your picture is not there, you will create a, your virtual representation called an avatar. You, I think these days, WhatsApp gives you the opportunity to do that. Create an avatar, a virtual representation of yourself. So you'll be talking to somebody, you don't know the person. Yeah. Snap, anybody here? Snap, ladies. 
There are different ways to collaborate, you see. <laughs> yeah, so there are different ways to collaborate. Vector meetings using cloud collaborations using Google Drive. I can put some of you have iPhones, you use what? iCloud. You can put things there, share the link with somebody to have access to. Now the last, the last part. The last part. We want to look at how time and space can affect collaboration. Time and space, how it can affect collaboration. As we are in this class right now, the time is 3.10. But somebody is in Moho and he's part of this class. Somebody is in Wa and he's part of this class. So we are basically looking at two things there, physical presence and time. The time is the same. The same time, but the location is what? Different, but we are collaborating because of what? Technology, this particular technology. I am also collaborating with those of you who are here. And in terms of the time space matrix, we are looking at the same time, the same space, the same place. Are you getting it? The same time, the same place. But with those online, the same time, can you think of another alternative? There are four options. We have just looked at two. The same time, the same place. The same time, different place. What other option can we have? Different time, different place. Is that possible? Any example? Different time, different place. If somebody is in the US, <laughs> somebody is in the US and joins. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yes, different place, different time. I, 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 an opportunity escaped me because of this time lapse, time and space lapse. I was scheduled for an interview and I misunderstood the time. Not knowing it was around 2 a.m. And that was there at 9 a.m. So ah, I slept, snored, and got up, <laughs> put, in, put on my suit and I ring myself and I was sitting in front of myself. <laughs> Thank you, pass. No show. That's when it dawned on me that I would check your email. So I went and checked my email. They said they have been waiting and waiting and waiting. And I never showed up because I didn't consider the time zone. Any other? The same place, different time. How can that happen? Some countries. Okay. So let's look at this diagram to conclude our lecture. Time, space, collaboration, and social tool matrix. So here we have different place, remote, same place. So this portion is about place, and this one is about what? Time. Then the first one, we have same place, same time. Face-to-face -face interactions, decision room, single display, group wear, shared table, wall displays. Where are we? Wall display, right? So we are here. Then we can also have so we can also have different time, same place. Hmm? Same place, different time, continuous task. And that can involve the use of team rooms, large public display, shift work, group wear. And how anybody who can give. A more practical example of that. Same place, different time. How can that work? The same time. Okay, you are doing same place. Okay, uh -huh, the same organization, uh -huh, but they are at different times. The previous slide we talked about virtual wells who come into play, and we said you can be here and be working for an organization in the U.S. So if you are in Ghana, they can schedule a meeting, and that meeting. The same organization, 
but your Ghana time may be 6 a.m. and their uh, Atlanta time is different. Then we also have different place, same time. Yes. Okay. So video conferencing, instant messaging, and whatnot. Then the last one, different place, different time. When you send someone an email in the US and he doesn't check, and later, later, he checks. You are in Ghana, the person, you are in Ghana, different place, is in the US. You have sent, he has not checked. He checks three hours later, different time. <laughs> or Australia. Any question? So, what are the benefits of collaboration? I thought I was going to do a one hour. It's one, it's 315. I can't believe it. <laughs> hmm? huh? Enhanced teamwork, yes. Increase productivity, efficiency. Yes, yes. Now, one thing I one big takeaway I I I, I want to leave with you would be. Two things. This whole topic was about two things only. Types of information systems and collaboration. And the types of information systems, we looked at the types of information systems in two ways. Classifying them in terms of where you sit in the organizational structure or classifying it based on what, what it does. That's one. Then the other part was collaboration. And we looked at the benefits, business benefits of collaboration. But we realize that in order to have increased productivity, better customer service, improved performance or whatnot, everything relies on the collaboration quality. And two things determine collaboration quality. These are, okay, but it will come under open culture. If the culture is not open, the boss will think that he knows everything and he wants you to fail so that he will rebuke you. So there's no open culture and there'll be no knowledge sharing. But open culture comes under something. Decentralized. Yes, the centralized system comes under something. There was a the diagram. Collaboration. Ah, the takeaway must happen. Yes. It's a major takeaway for me. Collaboration. It's, it's added to the collaboration. Yes, he's right. Yes. Mm -mm. The technology is on one yes. side. He, he's jumping the gun. This guy. <laughs> yes. Culture. Collaboration like culture. It's uh, uh, oh, uh, open no. culture. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to show the slide. Well, we are looking at two things, and the two things lead to, yes. Teamwork, I think it comes under one of those. You didn't draw it. There were two leading to quality and then performance. I want to, I'll bring it back so that you don't forget it. <laughs> it's loving collaboration capability. So there must be an open culture, decentralized structure, breadth of collaboration, and the technology. You combine this. So, so you see that which concept can in the first lecture can you relate this to? Let me cap my question in a different way. If you invest in collaborate collaboration technology or collaborative technology, huh? Investment in collaborative technology does not guarantee collaborative quality, true or false. Yes, it does not. You must invest in a complementary asset. What would be the complementary asset here? Mm -mm. What would be the, the, the complementary asset? In order to achieve collaborative quality, 
you must invest in two things, collaborative technology and a complementary asset. What is a complementary asset? Collaborative cap capability. So you can invest all you have, all your money, license Zoom accounts, license whatever, but there's nobody in the organization to use it. Or the top client of the organization, they won't allow you to use it. So there's a Zoom account, but they won't give it to you. Eh? Don't want to say, gee, are you getting it? They have subscribed to the best of collaborative technologies, but they have kept it to themselves. It's only when the managers are going to have a meeting, then they will now use it. When the watchmen are going to have a meeting, they won't allow them to also do Zoom. Are, are you getting it? So there's no open culture. Meanwhile, you have procured, let them also feel that they are part of the technology. So you have a staff meeting and you tell the security guard, you can join via Zoom. Once you are sitting at the gate, excellent. That way, you will be able, you will have an open, if you don't have an open culture, you can't do that. Because you say, ah, security, how can you use? But forgetting that everybody uses a smartphone these days, even if they are like my people, he will give you the phone and say, you have a number one Get me this number. So with, even with that, they will, they will still give it to people to connect to them. But for them not to leave posts and still take part in a meeting and contribute is an example of an open organizational culture, which contributes immensely to collaboration capability. This and that leads to this. Take this serious because the crux of collaboration lies what? This. We all know the different kinds of collaborative technologies, but we must understand that without the capability, the technology is what? Useless. That is how come an organization will procure technology and not use it. Uh, they will procure technology, but even people in the organization are not aware because the top guys are only interested in their 10%. Once they get it, technology is redundant. Nobody talks about it again until there is another procurement cycle. You buy another one. This brings us to the end of uh, today's lecture. So what I will do, last week I promised that I will bring the 10 paper, but I felt that I may scare you. At least I've given you an idea what the 10 paper will be about. So you can start talking among yourself, whether you do it in groups of say five, or individually. The groups leads to free riding. There will be free riders. Uh -huh. But I, I, I usually go for the groups because that's when you can, we're talking about collaboration. Uh -huh. That's when you can get to know each other. Because next session, when everybody moves to their, to their option, you will interact again. So I, I would urge that when I share it, you identify each other, maybe groups of five so that you can, you can work on it. Free riders will be identified. <laughs> All right. Well? All right, okay. So, all right, thank you very much. Then uh, we'll meet next week.